Okay. Okay, why don't we call this here meeting to order um, and roll call. I believe we have everybody but David at this point. And Anne. And Anne. So Matt, why don't we elevate Matt to uh, voting status. And um, before we go into the, the reading of the minutes, um, um, I'd just like to give a heads up um, to those that may be wanting to, um, to uh, hear about David Lewis, oh, I'm sorry, Victor Lewis, um, uh, 9C at the end of the meeting. Um, there, there won't, we're going to receive that letter tonight. We're not going to, uh, we're not going to act on it in, in, in any way. So just keep that in mind. It's, it's at the very end of this meeting. Okay. Um, so reading and approval of minutes. Uh, 3A regular meeting. Anybody have anything? Uh, I'll make a motion that we accept that we uh, accept the regular meetings minutes. Second that. Any further discussion? <laughs> All in favor? Of raising your hand. All right. Uh, minutes accepted for June 9th. Uh, and the special meeting minutes of June thirtieth. Does anyone have anything on that? I'll move that we adopt those minutes. Second. All in favor? Aye. Okay, so we've adopted those. Okay, um, so moving on to old business. Uh, first, first item on the agenda is uh, clarification of baseline of operations and aspirations of club getaway. Um, I think everyone just recently, because I think we just received it today, got a copy of um, what I would call the baseline of operations from club getaway. It was a four page sheet. Did everybody see those? No. Um, so, um, as, as we've been, we've been discussing, um, and I think the way this should move, um, um, as far as the, the, uh, the regulatory approach to this, this is a pre-existing non-conforming use. And I think we've all accepted that. We all know what it is. Um, when we first started out, we asked for a baseline um, uh, operations and uh, they have uh, submitted it. So um, um, that's, that's the clarification that I believe that we were looking for all the way along. Uh, I've read it. Um, and um, as I recall, um, a club getaway in the days of Victor Fink, that's, that's pretty much the operation that he had. Um, um, I thought, <coughs> did anybody, hey David, did uh, everyone else have the same impression? I, I thought the baseline of operations was, was great and, and really pretty thorough. Um, I read the whole thing and, you know, learned some things that they do and, uh, but I thought it was really thorough and, uh, and well done. So this is really a recognizing of their vested rights that we all know or are there as a pre-existing use. Um, and um, um, so, I would submit that um, that we should accept this and and uh, as as the clarification and and move on.
I agree with that. I, I don't think that, um, I think writing a regulation for this is, is all sorts of problems it, or potential problems, I should say, not problems. Um, and we have a, we have a pre-existing non-conforming use that's been here for, for many, 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 many years. And, um, I think we can accept that we have a baseline of operations. We understand um, what they do and what they or what they plan to do, and um, I think that uh, that satisfies me. And it is confined to one area. Yeah. Um. Can I chime in? I don't know if I'm allowed to talk. Of course. Yeah. So for, first of all, thank you. Um, so all I did was submit the same document that, that was back in the September meeting, uh, September of 2021. It's the same exact document. Um, and, you know, which, which is a baseline and it's what we do. Um, I just, I, what I don't understand is why, you know, if we're working to create regulation and, and you have a business in, in town trying to conform with the zoning regulation. And here's my biggest concern. We had a special meeting in July 20th, um, of this music concert, whatever, the disaster that happened here. Um, and at that point, it was labeled a special event. My biggest concern as a business is what is considered a special event? And when, what happens if I do, uh, if, if, if I'm hosting an adult weekend and, and, and it's a different commission than it is right now, is that gonna be considered a special event? You know, these are my fears as, as, as a longstanding business and hopefully a future longstanding business in, in, in the community. Well, for me, David, your, your, uh, your baseline of operations here would cover your having a an adult weekend, mm -hmm. and and what it doesn't say on here is that you're going to have a concert. You know, I, when I read this, and I read everything that you listed. Okay. Um, and when I I didn't see anything on here that I didn't always understand was something that that club getaway does or did and that the concert was was something different it is not something that you or victor had ever done before um, as far as i know and um and it was impactful on the community it was mm -hmm. impact, impactful on your neighbors and um uh, but that's not listed so if you want to do something like that again i think that would be a special event mm -hmm. but i think that everything that's on your list here if we accept this as your baseline of operations i think that all those things are pretty well covered i don't know what everybody else thinks this is just what well also I read this and what i see yeah i don't think special events are prohibited i, I think we just have to know about them R right so, and, and i guess my question is like, so so i host a wedding would a, would would a wedding be considered a special event? I mean, th these are I I just want to make sure that that there's a clarification. So, uh, you, you know, and and again, that was an extreme, and 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 that was something that was different. But you know, it just brought up that question in my mind. Wow, what if you know what if all of a sudden something's tagged as a special event, and and according to the regulations, I believe you could only host one special event a year. But my whole business is special events. So Adam, I'm, I'm gonna push back on what you're saying just a little bit. Uh, the language here has some open-ended statements in it, like private events include, but are not limited to. Uh, if we were going to accept a document, it's kind of a definition, then we would have to remove any ambiguous language. There's questions in language about whether or not it can be running as a hotel or an Airbnb. That would be need to be clarified if this is gonna run as a normal, as a hotel or not. Um, you know, the white labeled partner programs, sorry, <laughs> again, uh, 
you know, there's an event here and, you know, it talks about brand activations, film, TV productions. And if they're going to do a, you know, they're going to film a TV show. Sorry. They're going to film a TV show uh, of a concert. Like there's just, there's not a lot of clarity in some of this. So I'm not opposed to the idea of taking a self, uh, you know, defined document, but it, I'd prefer that it become explicit as if it were a regulation, clearly delineating what normal is. And even if it's not normal, then it becomes a special event. And if we want to allow, you know, a certain number of special events, I, I'd prefer it be stated very clearly in here. And then just one more clarity, I guess my question would be if, if he does want to do something new or different, that means he's recommending him to go to the Board of Appeals, right? If you wanted to adjust something going forward once we have a baseline. Yeah. yeah. Why would it why would it be the Board of Appeals and not to this commission? Um, because you're pre-existing non-conforming. And at that point in time, anything that you want to get want, that you would like to do, you would have to get a variance. So I'm not opposed to the idea of going without a regulation, but if we're not going to write a regulation, then we need to write we need this to read as if it were a regulation, so there's clarity for the future board and whatever member is going to be here, and clarity about what some of these very amorphous things are. Because yeah, it, it could be very, like, there, there are people in the future, there might be a future owner of Club Getaway, and there's going to be future uh, board members here. Um, they may have a very different interpretation of some of these, some of this language. So I, I would just want to see it a lot more defined if we're going to depend on it. I don't disagree with you, David. I think that it may be a better way to go to make this a little more ironclad. Well, we can. Well, I think we can certainly edit what what they've got. Um, but um, um, this this the the pre existing non conforming way to regulate is far from perfect. Far from perfect. Uh, but but what it doesn't do is establish a a right uh, and, and de defined by some regulations for this to happen in other places, which of course has always been my concern. What what I'm confused about and what I don't understand is why. If there's a business in Kent wanting to be you know, a non-conforming, pre-existing non-conforming entity in Kent, looking to be a, and, and again, maybe this is, I, I, I just don't understand, why is there pushback? Why, why, what's the pushback that to, to create a regulation for a business that's already in Kent? And maybe that's a question Dwight and I need to talk about after, but I just don't understand. I think if it's a regulation, if it applies to you, it applies to all pursuant to that uh, regulation. Right now, this is a confined use. Okay. So anybody, David, that's that's as property that is large enough can actually do what you're doing in the rural district if there's a regulation. And I think that's the fear um, that Les has, that, that this is going to be something um, that could pop up elsewhere. And so by making you pre-existing non-conforming, then that use can't be done anywhere else within the rural district. And that you would then still be able to operate as pre-existing non-conforming um, under the baseline that you've submitted of your business activities now. I don't necessarily agree with that. I understand the rationale. I understand the reasoning. I think, I think we're um, we had looked at the overlay district. We have looked at floating zones. We've we, and I think we've never done anything like that. I think there might be a little bit of uh, on my part. There's a little bit of hesitation on instituting something that's like that that Kent has never seen before. So I, I want to ask a couple of questions, and 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 they're based on 
um, my my much the, the platform or or the position that I'm coming from is that the 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 point is of, of the regulations is to as much as possible bring pre-existing non-conforming um, properties parcels into a more conforming environment into a into into something that's more conforming rather than less conforming and and we're we're not allowed to increase in nonconformity. So my question is, is it the position of this commission that what David doing there, that club getaway is an undesirable use for the town of Kent? I'm not sure anybody uh, would submit that. So following up with that, that's, that's, that's what I would suggest too. Um, following up with that, why, why would the commission take the position that it's it would be an undesirable use any place else except where it is. I mean, it's a desirable use wh where it is. I think I'd, I'll make that I'd, I'll, I'll I'll make that leap if I may. So what's to say that it's 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 not a desirable use someplace else? I think it's a matter of planning. Uh, I I I I don't know. Uh, I can think of a lot of places where this could happen, and um, uh, I'm not so sure that would be very desirable. Mr. Chairman, this is Dwight Merriam. Can I can I speak briefly on a couple of the points raised, Mr. Sure, Chairman? Sure. Yes, thank you. Uh, as Commissioner Birnbaum has said, that one of the alternatives here is to provide more detail on the extent of the non-conforming uses and create a sort of ersatz, if you will, regulation. Uh, and that's a possibility. That's a possible path. I don't think it's the most desirable path for all of the stakeholders. As to the question of whether adopting a regulation designed to facilitate club getaway will open the door to other sites. In the memorandum I provided, I noted that you could as a commission, with the advice and counsel of Glenn Childer and Donna Hayes and others, limit, limit, the total acreage to this type of use to say 325 acres. So there's other sites in town like this. Excuse me? There, there are other sites like that. This is not total. Oh, no, no, total acreage in the town to 325 acres, period. Oh. So that would preclude, at least with regard to Club Gutterway, with anybody else doing more because that would exhaust the limit. Just like you have so many acres of residential, so many acres of commercial, you can have so many acres of uh, resort and, and conference center. So you should not be worried. I'm just telling you, you should not be worried about adopting a regulation that causes others to come in because there are several different ways we can control it. My final point is that the struggle here at this point is what happens when David wants to change his operation slightly? And as Donna Hayes suggests that uh, if it's a non-conforming use, he's got to go to the Zoning Board of Appeals and request a variance, uh, for which it's difficult. 90% of the variances are frankly are granted illegally because they can't meet the necessary a practical difficulty and the necessary hardship. Whereas if you had a regulation you could keep the control of the changes at Club Getaway in your commission. So that if he wanted to add an additional service or some more residential use or some more banquet use, or I don't know what, it would have to come back to you for your review and approval rather than go over to the Zoning Board of Appeals and, and, and talk about a variant. So, um, I would just say that number one, if you want to go down the path of refining the scope of operations to have more detail, that's possible. If you want to do a regulation, you should not fear that a regulation will necessarily allow others to come in because I can tell you, I know how to preclude that from happening. Absolutely. And number three is you need to consider, it seems to me, whether you wanna give up control over changes that occur here or keep it within the planning and zoning commission as modest amendments are made rather than cause club getaway. They have to go over to the ZBA for variance. So 
I, I appreciate it. Uh, Thank you. I want to add my support to Matt's comment as well. Like, I feel it's it's very it feels very disingenuous to say this is a, a, a good use here and only here. Uh, it just doesn't feel like it stands up to what planning and zoning is supposed to be about. It feels like we would we should be able to use the tools in our toolbox to uh, ensure that this use would be good. If it's going to be good somewhere else, that we can limit it to total acreage or you know we have things like traffic controls obviously you don't want to have this on a tiny back road in the middle of nowhere and expect to have you know 600 cars showing up for something um i would as i i would prefer to see it as a regulation david i think what you say is true about zoning but not necessarily planning uh, have we heard back from glenn childer he has my memo i don't know if we've heard back what do you what do you mean, Wes? Why? why? Well, I think that um, uh, as we had suggested uh, that um, uh, um, we we make this known in the POCD. Um, um, uh, as an acceptable uh, use in its current location. Um, I don't know. I've I've expressed my view as a as a as a as a single um, a commissioner. I um, I I hadn't thought about the fact that he would have to go in front of the ZBA if he wanted to make a change, and I um. I don't think that that is a. A reasonable, um, solution because, in the end. Uh, ZBA to, to meet the requirements for the for the ZBA to approve something, um, you know, it, it's incredibly difficult to, to make a minor change that that should be acceptable, that would be acceptable to the Planning and Zoning Commission. Um, it it may not be able to be able to pass the ZBA, even if the ZBA thought it was a minor change also. Um, so I, I I don't I don't think a solution of of that ends in in club getaway having to go in front of the CPA um, is a good solution. But um, maybe an overlay zone or a cap to to the number of acreage um, that can be used in the town of Kent for this use. Um, and if we did that. That would also enable somebody else who wanted to do it to come before us and see if we would modify the regulation. There you go. And acreage. There you um, go. But it wouldn't, uh, and we wouldn't have to do that. You know, that would be at that time. And we can do this all under a special permit, which, which gives us the, I believe we can, that, that gives us the added ability to put, to, put restrictions um, on the use. So I do think that we can craft a, a regulation that limits that limits the, the possible expansion of this um, to somewhere that, that the commission now or the commission later would feel was, was inappropriate for so our county. So regulation gonna look like um, his um, his uh, his outline scope here. Could we ask Glenn to take this as input and craft a draft for us? He's our, that's sort of what he does, right? I assume he could turn this into something that um, looks, stand the test of time a little better and read more in line with our existing regulations. Yeah. I. I I mean, and that's a, a partly a question for Wes and for and for Donna, but I don't see why he couldn't take this baseline of operations, um, and then and, and and craft a a limiting regulation, special permit regulation, um, that will allow Club Getaway to to operate their business, allow them if they did have some change or wanted to add some service that wasn't listed here. Um, to come back before the commission and look for a change to that special permit um, 
and not and have and not have the the unintended consequences of uh, of a more broader um, of a more broader, of a broader regulation uh, that covers the whole rural zone. So, Donna, could we do that? Yeah, I mean, Glenn has some of the stuff, um, but I think with his involvement in the rewrite of the plan of conservation and development, it was not really something that he had wanted to take on or had the time to take on at this point in time. But now that the plan of conservation and development has at least have getting ready, hopefully, um, to be done in September, um, I don't see why uh, he can't take the information that we already have and we have a lot of it and send it over to Glenn and see if he can't come up with something. I mean, you know, we, and, and not, and to use David, the, the brewery as a prime example, I mean, it took us a year to draft that regulation. We worked it through and we came up with something that was really good in the, special, in, in, the in the rural zone that we had never had before. And that was something that I had wanted for David just to at least have some kind of a definition as a special permitted use with conditions based on the size of the property, um, you know, with the conditions similar to what we had, uh, had put on to David for the brewery. You know, hours of operation, the length of operation, um, you know, the maximum number of people, Torrington area health um, or state health involvement would need to be involved in there as well. So. I do think that Glenn would be able to pull something out to compile it and make it a special permitted use um, that that would work. Well, that would further the discussion here, wouldn't it? So why don't we do that? Do we need to make a motion or is this is administrative request? It would just be an administrative request. Great. So I will shoot him off an email um, either tonight or first thing tomorrow morning. I mean, poor David's been hanging on by his fingers for uh, almost a year. <laughs> so I don't think anybody anticipated it going that long. So, um, I, you know, I think it would make him feel a lot more comfortable knowing that um, that that he he's set with planning and zoning. And, and can go on these operations and start um, handling some of those wonderful things. Wes, if we uh, if it's if we if we go down that road and, and if you get you know past your um, your your reluctance, you know, to, to your, to, I, I understand you you feel um, differently than than writing regulation. Um, would you would you say that we should ask Glenn if we're going to go down the road of regulation to recommend which way to regulate um, per Mr. Miriam's memo of last month, um, or should we let him review those and then craft a regulation that uh, that he thinks fits within for for us? I mean, because he knows us. Well, I think that that uh, his his memo was part of that baseline. And I think that that would be a, a, a good way to start. And there, there, and there may be others. I have talked to, um, to Glenn about it. And I, and I think that he's looking at doing something that is just very simple and basic in line with all of the other special permitted uses that are set up right now within Kent. I think he wants to kind of stay within that framework because the framework works well for us. Um, and so, you know, I think Glenn is more inclined to be a little bit more simpler and to the point. He doesn't think that, um, my impression was that he did not think we needed to um, beat a dead horse and that let's just get it done one, two, three, and it could be an easy, um, an easy addition to the special permitted uses in the world. Okay, I, I, I agree with that. I, uh, I, I, I remember though, not though, I remember that the, the whole the start of this, as David said in the very beginning, David Schreiber, that uh, somewhat falls out of that, uh, uh, of the concert that, that we had. And, and it's, there should be some protection for the neighbors 
right. but there should also be some protection for the business, right? right? That, that back and forth was, uh, right. um, it was somewhat painful because there was the people were looking at it from different perspectives and there wasn't anybody who was looking at it. Well, not too many people were looking at it from a neutral standpoint. I think bringing David in on the conversation would be good because he's had the conversations with the neighbors and he knows what the neighbor neighbor's tolerance levels are. You know, so um, you know we can use that information to set some of the conditions based on those tolerances. I will talk to Glenn tomorrow. Okay. So. You hear a motion to table five v one. I make that motion. Okay. All in favor? <clears throat> okay, so we'll take this up next next month. Mark, did you second? I did. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. I appreciate it. Thank you, Thank you Mr. Chairman, you. members of the commission. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thanks. Now we're taking the rest of the night off. You can continue working. Oh, you're so. <laughs> So long, Donna. Bye, Dwight. Bye. Good night. Wes, um, forgive me. Um, I will. Uh, I'll, I'll rescind my my voting uh, status. That's that since David's here. Is that is that correct? Uh, what going forward here? Yes. No. No, I think you can stay. Don't you? I, I always thought that that the, that a full commission of seven was the voting, and then we we elevated people to vote um, if there was one missing. Right. Yeah, I think. That's... Okay. okay. So we're going to de-elevate Matt. Hello. Are you there? Who is this? This is Barbara Gehrig. And I live across the street from um, Club Getaway, and I have no complaints about them at all, at any time. That's yeah, wonderful to hear. Pardon me? That's, That's wonderful, wonderful to, hear. to hear. That's good news. Good, yes. I, I like them as neighbors. That's terrific. Thank you very much. You're welcome. All right, shall we move on to 5B2? Uh, Dean Gregory for James Robinson. Um, is Dean here? Um, Mr. Hey. Chairman, uh, James Robinson, uh, the property owner. Uh, yeah, James, so, how you doing? I'm good, thanks, how are you? Well, David. I, I am here. I'm Dean Gregory. James is far more uh, tech savvy than I, so he, he's done a great job presenting uh, the matters at hand, but I'm here to answer questions too, if need be. My engineer was un unable to be here on my behalf. Terrific. So um, I think this is progressing quite nicely. Um, um, yeah, it's it's um, exciting. Uh, there's a couple of things I didn't totally understand the retainage uh, looking at the map. Um, um, there was um, an impound area. What, what is an impound area that's entitled on the map? Yeah, Mr. Mr. Chairman, commissioners, thanks uh, again for, for uh, reviewing this uh, application, um, and I'm happy to sort of go through the whole the whole presentation if if, if helpful. Sure. Or, um, I mean, just to quickly go to your question about the impoundment area. So this is a, 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 a natural um, uh, area that is already uh, there that, that that actually already collects water. Uh, seems to have good um, absorption of of, of runoff. Um, and I think uh, one of the commissioners last time actually sort of saw that the this sort of depression that already existed, there's a, um, a corrugated metal uh, pipe that already exists with a concrete opening. Um, so at some point, someone had 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 uh, installed that, um, and so we see that actually as a really good natural way of of directing water using the the swales. 
um, uh, and the the the, the cross um, slope uh, sloping of the, the the driveway and the terracing that we've 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 put in. So I don't know if that answers the the question. And Dean, you may have other things you want to want to say on that. Well, it, it does. I, I just... Can you share your screen? Can you share? Oh yeah. Um, just give me one second. Yeah, here we go. So we're talking about this area uh, just down here. Correct. I, I just didn't see how the water was directed into it. There was no clear indication of a swale leading to that area. Yeah, um, so uh, this is a rather amateur uh, uh, drawing that I, I did, not the engineer. And so, uh, uh, but he, as he explained it um, to me before this evening, um, so the swale really is running along along right. here. So the water uh, flow is, is designed to sort of go around the house and to be sort of cr cutting across the driveway and into this swale. Um, and then the, you see the, the gradient line sort of tilting down towards this natural impoundment area. So that's, again, Dean, you may want to jump in and, and, and correct me if I'm interpreting it uh, incorrectly. No, that's that's precisely what, what he has in mind, the engineer that is, and, and that sort of buffers the, uh, you know, the volume as it's coming down. Mm -hmm. So I can see that I just can't see this, this swale by your by by your topo adjustments that lead into the area. Uh, let me see if I can zoom in a, a little. Um... It, it, it looks to me like the swale leads directly into the road. Right, that's certainly not the in, intention. So uh, I, uh, I know this this area here, so I can't draw a, a straight a straight line in, in yeah. the PDF. Um, the intention is that this would run off down into into here. Okay, it it, it just wasn't it wasn't shown that way. That's all. And no, no, noted, and uh, you know we can certainly uh, c c correct that. Would would it be helpful to go through any of the other slides? I'm, I'm happy to sort of sure. go back, um, and I'll try and be relatively quick, and then can open it up to, to discussion. So I think you know last time we laid out the I think it was five issues that that the commission had uh, identified in the May meeting, and we explained that we couldn't take everything on um, within that one month period. But I think now we have hopefully managed to address all the concerns that were were, were raised. Um, and so I'll quickly go through um, what we've we've done with with the hope that we're in a in a good position. Again, this was a, a horizon line application that we're in a good position to, to move move forward. Um, so last time we talked about how uh, the, 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 the site is actually quite similar to Cobble Road, uh, 90 Cobble Road, just south of the, the lot rather than 60 Cobble Road, which I know has been problematic in, in the past. Um, and that sort of informed the way that we've designed and redesigned the, the, the site plan. We walked through the sort of existing topography and the fact that there's some natural platforms uh, that we're trying to use, as well as the, the, the natural inclines of the, the slope and finding what we call the sort of Goldilocks position that is far enough above and, and removed from the road, but that is also you know, nowhere near the horizon line. We're not going to disturb anything you know, for about 150 vertical feet and several hundred feet from the horizon line. So finding that sort of perfect position um, uh, and, and trying to minimize disruption uh, to the, 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 the road and, and the, the land. Um, I showed you a couple of, of, of pictures of, of the current conditions. Again, largely um, either new growth, some uh, dead wood, fallen trees and, 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 and branches. There are a few more mature trees, which we would uh, absolutely hope to, to hold on to um, where we could and pr preserve what we, what we can. Um, we then uh, walked through the revised uh, plan where we addressed the the question of the driveway and we looked at sort of five or six different options and and this was the one that we felt was was optimal um, for a, a number of reasons and by doing this we were going to reduce the amount of area to be cleared and graded by 40% uh, percent approximately reduce the length of the driveway by uh, more than 200 feet um, while still maintaining a, a barrier between the, the the road and and the site creating some natural terracing that 
would be good for absorption of any water and actually hopefully absorb more water than is currently um, uh, the, the, the case given the, the, the incline of the slope. Um, and the, the intent is to plant sort of indigenous or native trees and, and, and grasses and, 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 and shrubs to uh, help with ab absorption and, and erosion. Um, and we sort of divided the areas into the orange zones, which are those areas that would be disturbed during construction, um, uh, but that we would want to, to treat. And then the green zones, which are, are where we really wouldn't have to touch a, 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 a at all, um, which is the vast majority of, of the site. Um, so today, what, what's new in this presentation is uh, uh, la landscaping. Um, and so I'll quickly run through the in intent here. So uh, uh, as we uh, as I worked with a landscape ar architect, the brief was we want to try and replace or maintain at least 80% uh, of, 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 of trees and shrubs and plants uh, in the areas that we're going to be doing construction. Where we can, we want to preserve old growth. We've sort of divided the site into four zones, which we'll walk through in a, in a, in a moment. And each zone has a slightly different objective and, and slightly different soil uh, and light conditions that we've accounted for. Again, trying to maintain native uh, wildflowers, um, grasses, trees, shrubs that are, um, are known to do well in, in uh, Northwestern uh, Connecticut um, and, uh, and have a, a range of advantages, both as for pollination and, and again, for, for soil uh, conditions and root systems. And so the four zones that we uh, have, have outlined, really sort of zones one and three should be considered together. These are the zones that are directly above and below the, the house. Um, and the, the goal with, 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 with these are a couple of, of, of fold. Uh, we we want to make sure that um, these are prioritized for root systems. Um, and, and water uh, absorption. And so um, the, the, the landscape architect uh, prioritized uh, plants like uh, hay-scented ferns, uh, uh, Pennsylvania sedge, mountain laurel, uh, laurel um, silver uh, maple trees. Uh, zone two, this is essentially the area around the house, the, the, the front yard and the backyard as it, as it were, and, and this is really for uh, water absorption, uh, so, so water that's coming from the, the slope and landing on the sort of terrace uh, that the house has been built on, um, uh, and we want something that, we want shrubs that will grow quickly and create ground cover where the land has been, been uh, cleared, and so yarrow, uh, Canada wild rye, uh, New Jersey tea, uh, shag bark, uh, hickory, witch hazel, eastern uh, white oak. Uh, um, I'm, I'm told by an expert other things to, 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 to plant. Um, um, and then zone four, this is the area that uh, is closest to the road and our objectives here, uh, certainly absorption again, but also quick uh, uh, screening, um, things that will be leafy and um, create a, a natural barrier between uh, the, 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 the property and the, the site development and, and, and the road. Um, and uh, and so we've uh, identified tall swamp marigold, uh, cord grass, weeping love grass, smooth sumac, and American beech as some of the species that we'd want to want to plant there. Um, this is a little bit more detail. I won't won't go into all of this unless there's uh, questions, which I probably won't be able to answer um, my, myself. But to give you a, a sense of what we were imagining. Um, Obviously, the landscape architect uh, has a, a really wide uh, database of, of, of plants and their particular characteristics, what they what they will do for the land and where they'll thrive and, and not given the conditions. And so we've sort of lent into, into that. And I feel very confident in the advice that, that she's, uh, she's given us here. And uh, finally, on the landscaping, uh, divided into two phases. One is is sort of the um, immediate during construction. So as soon as the the, the site has been cleared and graded, um, which we're hopeful could be by uh, fall of this year, to immediately get in um, uh, heavy seeding of, of, of grasses, 
potentially cross plugs uh, that already have uh, root systems developed uh, that can even start to develop before the, the winter. And then as spring comes around, we'll be uh, primed to, 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 to take root and, and do, their, do their job. And then phase two would be somewhat more aesthetic, but also long-term stabilization. So more of the tree planting, um, um, uh, again, with the, the goals of further absorbing uh, water and, and creating um, stabilization. Uh, so that that's the the the, the sort of landscaping, and then uh, going back to this this chart, a couple of of sort of key key features. Um, uh, you know, again, we plan to take a, a advantage of the natural impoundment area at the bottom of the the the, the slope and the fifteen inch diameter CMP. Um, the house site, uh, the backyard, and the driveway are forming these natural terraces, which should break the flow of of water. The driveway um, will be permeable, so will allow uh, runoff to, to to seep in. It's not going to be uh, um, uh, hard surface, um, which should help. And certainly during construction, we would uh, use uh, water bars um, to to also break any flow of of, of water coming down the the driveway. And uh, the cross slope of the of the driveway, the curved parts in particular, to direct the water towards uh, uh, swales, and, and also the grading in order to to to, to head towards the, the the swales. So those are the, the sort of key features um, here. Um, a, a, a basic cross section. Obviously, there's uh, it's a quite a varied site, um, but this gives you an impression. Um, and cut and fill, we feel um, uh, actually will be uh, exactly balanced. There's no intention to either bring material onto the site nor to remove material from the site, uh, aside from some sand uh, that would be used for the the driveway during construction. Um, so we really tried to work with what is 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 there, um, and. Uh, um, uh, I, 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 again, not allow anything that is 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 too too steep. Um, and again, Dean, you may have other things you want to add to to this 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 bit. Uh, that's that's you know not really sand for the driveway. However, just you know gravel, obviously. But um, no, I think you covered that accurately. I mean, basically, the the I reviewed the site with my uh, excavation contractor and. Um, he's he's quite confident that it's um, you know the manner in which he'll be cutting as he goes up gradient um, he'll be able to you know uh, disperse an equivalent amount of material in the fill zone areas as noted um, it's a little difficult to to pinpoint the exact calculation um, without you know digging you know too much deeper into specific depths of each and every contour so. Um, based on his experience, um, you know, and, and what he saw on site, uh, he, he does believe that there's certainly more than enough room to um, dissipate um, and grade out as needed and according to the plan with, you know, the on-site material. You know, generally speaking, um, you know, the, the question is usually if, you know, if you're going to be removing material and or are you bringing material in in, in this particular circumstance, we be you know just using the on-site material um and then finally there's a question about uh confirming uh emergency vehicle access and uh we've uh, apl applied the 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 the, the the template um, and confirmed that uh, it's a it's a 32 uh, foot diameter uh, radius um, and and that indeed uh, will accommodate a, a fire truck or other larger vehicles um, should there be some kind of need for for emergency emergency access. So that's those are the the the, the core slides that um, we submitted and 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 welcome any 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 question. Again, uh, really grateful to the commission for your review and hopeful that we we've provided what's needed to to be able to move forward. James, I thank you for this. You've taken this extremely seriously, and um, um, uh, your landscaping. Uh, I I think it's a better plan. Um, um, and again, my only concern was the the direction of water flow uh, off, so that it doesn't go onto the road. Yeah, I, I don't see it, but uh, but you're representing that it will go into this impound area. 
And Mr. Chairman, I mean, uh, that's absolutely our in intent. And I, I believe we'll have to submit uh, uh, the, 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 the site uh, uh, plan for land use approval, and it will be represented on that, uh, on that document. Does anyone else have any uh, any comments on this? I, I think they've they've um, have done a good job here. Daryl, you're in the business. What do you think? Uh, I think that their their plant palette's very um, ambitious, um, but I think it's very appropriate um, and creative. Um, I know that they'll probably squeeze down the selection, which might be actually desirable to sort of blend in with what's around it. You don't want to create too much of an island of dense diversity amidst what's there, but um, I think that the, the plant material for the various zones makes sense. Um, you know, I think all this discussion has led to a better result for the applicant and the town. Um, I think most importantly, you know, this property has a portion of it that's in the horizon line district. They chose to site their home outside of that. So a lot of our discussions are applicable, but aren't necessarily something that, um, it's needed, you know. The bonus for citing your house outside of the horizon line is that you don't have to go through as many hoops. Um, so I think the discussions, once again, have been beneficial, but um, I think they've gone above and beyond what's required in our regulations. I agree with that. So can we move on with this application? Do I hear? Uh, yeah, I, I was I was going to make a motion, but I couldn't get myself off of mute. Um, but I, I think they answered all of the questions we had and um, and more. And um, so I'll make a motion that we approve application forty two twenty two C, Dean Gregory and James Robinson, eighty two Cobble Road, Map Nine, Block forty two, Lot twelve, construction of a two family dwelling driveway and associated site work in the horizon line conservation district. Second. Any further discussion on this? All in favor. Motion approved. James, thank you very much. This is, um, th th this is a very nice presentation. No, thank, thank you. And uh, as I said at the outset, I mean, we're very committed to being positive contributors to the town and want to do what's right. And, and so appreciate all your time and feedback and, uh, and uh, you know, hope to um, um, have the results to sh show for it before too long. Great. Perfect. Thank you. Thanks so much. Okay, shall we move on to 5B3, proposed change in, in uh, regulations, electric vehicle charging stations. Donnie, you want to start this off? You're the, kind of the author of this. Yeah, hi. Um, we had, um, actually, we had talked about trying to figure out what we were going to do with electric charging stations, I thought that we would have had a little bit more time in order to work on this, but I did get an application from the Kent School to put in two of them. So it just kind of pushed us into this whole processing of a regulation type thing. So, you know, I had asked out on the list serve if anybody had um, had electric vehicle charging station regulations. Um, I did not get a lot of answers. I got a lot of, oh yeah kind of things, you know, we'd love to see what you have when you're done. Um, so I think we're, we're, we're gonna be starting this from scratch. Um, one of the things that we can do, which is what we did with, um, with the cannabis was to actually change just the definition um, of 
um, of what is included in retail and do that by changing the definition of a structure. So if you look at the current definition of a structure, um, it does exclude fences measuring six feet or less, um, grade, at grade driveways, at grade walkways, at grade terraces and at grade patios. Um, and so maybe what we could do is just excluding electric vehicle chargers um, uh, in that suggested wording and then, then we're all set. Um, but I guess my question then becomes, do you wanna add a definition of what an electric vehicle charging station is? So these were a couple that I had seen. Actually, I had gotten them from Dwight. Um, and so I'm really gearing this towards the village center, commercial village center, residential one and two, maybe. Um, in the rural district, you're not gonna get an electric vehicle charging station. Um, you're, you're gonna get a home charging um, line in your garage. You might have a, something that's attached to the outside. So this would just be something that would be um, in, in special permitted situations like the schools um, and then in the village center. Donna, I don't, I don't know if this is responsive, but um, my only thought about all this is I would not want to see electric vehicle charging stations on Main Street or 341. And just simply excluding them from the definition of structure would not permit them to be anywhere. Um, I thought that what we were going to do for the village center commercial, which was something that um, Glenn had talked about with regard to the plan of conservation and development was identifying at least four areas within the village center commercial area where they could be put. Um, and that would not include route seven, but it might include um, you know, the village green, the village center. It might include the Pacto gas station. It could include um, the Kent Barnes, that type of thing, um, you know, putting a couple. What happened was the federal government, according to Gene, has designated Kent as a, um, what did she say, Matt, do you, or David, do you remember? Yeah, uh, like a sustainability corridor or something like yeah, that. An alternative fuel corridor. Yeah, I think that was it. Um, so they're going to be looking for charging stations along the Route 7 corridor. I agree with you, Mark. I don't believe that they belong on Route 7. Um, I think I don't think they were taken into consideration with regard to um, the streetscape. Um, so that's why I think if, when we start talking about the village center commercial, I think we need to find and identify areas where they should be. My biggest concern when it comes to the village center commercial area um, is the desire for advertising. Because Litchfield just went through something where they wanted to put two charging stations in front of the shop right there, um, and, or stop and shop, and it had seven feet worth of advertising on top of it. It was like this number two charger and then a seven foot banner um, of all of this different advertising that spun around in the wind. And, um, and, and that was not um, um, willingly accepted by the town of Richfield, and so therefore it was denied. But, but le leaving the preferred areas to the POCD, the POCD is not is not enforceable. I no, mean, it's not. It's the recommendation. It's, it's not at all. So what I'm saying is, I did not create anything for the village center because I want to see what you guys want to do for the village center commercial based on the recommendation that was made in the POC. Well, are we differentiating between freestand, like the idea of a freestanding uh, charging station, the likes, you know, where you see the station purposely built versus the smaller level two units that are more like unobtrusively hung on an existing telephone pole or something? Because one of them is something that the, one of them is like a third party is generally trying to make money out of it somehow. And so they're either gonna pay for it with like an EVgo card or with advertising. The other one might be uh, you know, installed more as a, as a convenience, but they're not large. So it, 
I don't know if it's worth having that differentiation of the definition. I, I wouldn't want to see big charging stations on seven either, but if, if someone runs a line down the telephone pole and puts, you know, a nine by 18 charger that a parallel parking electric car could use, it doesn't seem like it'd be quite as big an imposition necessarily. Right, but I think they would have to work with Eversource because we don't have, you know, jurisdiction over the, the poles that are holding the electric lights. Uh, right, but I've seen other things okay. like that put on poles. Like it might be through Eversource. I just yeah. don't want. I just want to say it's like we might want to think about it a little bit differently of a of a purpose built charging station versus one that's hung. The same way we don't necessarily regulate an attachment to something having a permanent location on the ground. Right. Like it almost already falls in that. For example, <laughs> it might be one way to look at it. I was thinking of the ones that are smaller than um, a mailbox like the one because we have one out here in, in the town at the town hall something similar to that um yeah you hear know about the one yeah the one that's the that's uh was it's got a standing structure though but it's pretty right. relatively not huge but i mean the ones we put at the brewery and at my house are, are like the size of an ipad they're very small right they don't right. take a lot of space but how long does it take for them to charge? Because that's the other consideration that you want to have. If well, there's a, they're both level two, but the high end level two is actually pretty, it's not a level three charger, but it's it's re respectably fast. It's a 70 amp charger. So I think that works out to uh, like two hours. 25 two hours. kilowatts. It's twice as fast as like a typical one. The one at the town is six kilowatts. So this one's at least three times faster, but it's still a level two connector. I As we talk about these different chargers, um, I think it's a good discussion, but I, I'm not sure how, uh, if we're going to create this regulation, um, I think we can put some restrictions on, on advertising or lit up uh, screens or, or, or a height restriction. So there aren't these banners or, or twisty things flying around in the air, but, um, but we can't, I don't know I mean, you, that we can regulate to everybody had to have a, these tiny little chargers, you know, if they want to put a commercial charger in, you know, and, and these chargers that people are going to may put in, hopefully we'll put in, um, are going to be for pay. They're, they're not, you know. Right. These, I'm not, I'm not, I guess I guess I'm not looking at them as personal chargers because with the new building code that's going into place in October, it's going to be a requirement that the mechanism to charge an electric car in your garage has to be provided for in the new build. It doesn't have to be wired, but it has to have the, 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 the guts have to be there so that if you need to use it, you just have to wire it. That's going to be part of the building code. Um, and that will be something that's inside your garage. Right, um, but I'm not talking so, about what goes in somebody's personal garage. I'm talking about what 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 the Kent what the Kent Village Barnes decides to put in their parking lot um, or have somebody put in their parking lot where somebody puts in their credit card and pays $20 for for their half an hour car charge or 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 what the Kent Green wants to install to you know, a bank of, of chargers. So there's a whole bunch of chargers which bring people back there and they pay for it. Right. Um, that's, I mean, that's, that's what we're regulating here. And, right. That's uh, what I'm talking about. Exactly. That's exactly it. We're mm -hmm. having these discussions that all these various little different kinds of chargers, but I'm not sure that that's, uh, that's I, I don't know how we, we have that discussion because tomorrow there's another one. And the what next day that one changes. What is it we want to con regulate? Is it, we just want to regulate a big, ugly, giant advertising banner on seven? Like, no. Do we care otherwise? What What is it that, that we're trying to control? Well, what we're trying to control is the fact that if something is a structure, it need, needs to meet a setback. So right, I understand that issue now. But what, with, with regard to like the chargers at the Kent School, um, they would have to be 40 feet back from the front property line. Right, so, but we know we don't, oh, I shouldn't say we know. The idea is that the charger has to be where people park. Exactly. So 
we could just say you're allowed to have a charger within two feet of a parking spot. But it seems like the concerns we have are more about a big flashy distraction as opposed to utility aspect. My what I was thinking was that we just eliminate the need to meet any kind of setback and then not allow advertising. So and I don't think I don't care if there is advertising so long as the thing is back in Kent Green's parking lot where you don't see it from Main Street and not on Main Street. I mean, yeah, no, I agree with that 100%. Parking, lot, parking on Main Street is already uh, very tough. I don't think we should allow any of these chargers on Main Street. Right. Yeah, no, that isn't a factor for us. I, I mean, I, I totally agree with you, Mark. Um, but to put it on Main Street, they have to go to the DOT. Yes. We don't we don't control that. That that's a state that's a state highway. Right. So what happens on Main Street, we don't control the parking there. We don't con if they go to the state and the state says they can put it there, I'm not sure what we do. Yeah, I mean the state would end up having to give them an encroachment um, permit in order to do that. And it, it is out of our hands. But, but, it, uh, but it could be on the turn in next to the liquor store. Visible yeah. from Main Street as you walk down the sidewalk. Yes, it could be. And that's where we need to control the amount of advertising or if, whether it's lit up advertising. Um, I'm just not sure we're forward thinking enough. Right? The idea is in 10 years from now, the majority of the cars are probably going to be electric. So if you're saying today you don't want to have chargers on the street, I think in 10 years, that's going to feel like a pretty backward decision. <laughs> well, I think in 10 years, goal. but it's in 10 years, the technology is going to change and you're not going to need anything that looks like a small mailbox. Well, I mean, they said that about telephones too, but you know, your 1950 two wire phone is still works and still regulatorily applied and you can upgrade the charger. Just, you you just, uh, you know, the new box might go in. Mm -hmm. It just seems like we want to we want to encourage this. We want to encourage chargers. We want to discourage advertising. Maybe we leave advertising. You have to respect the setbacks. Otherwise, you know, keep it. You know, limit the total footprint next to a parking spot or something like that. I don't want to say that there can't be advertising, um, and I don't. I don't think that's what Mark was saying either. But I think we have to. We should limit how much advertising you know um, is on we special right? permitted if you have advertising if you don't have advertising it's... well so look at the gas station we don't allow them to have lit up screens and tvs you know at their pumps because it's right. in the middle of our town and that should go the same for for electric chargers i think we we can we can allow chargers to come in without without having them light up our whole town and light yeah. up what ends up being somebody's backyard or outside of somebody's apartment. That seems reasonable. Do you want me to take what I've created and send that to Glenn and see if he can tweak it, look at it, give him another, you know, keep him busy? Sure, pick up the one. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I don't, I don't know, you know, I mean, I'm just, you could know, we make, could, could we, would it be, would the commission agree that we would like to encourage low profile, non-lit, non-advertised car charges be placed almost by right convenient to cars. And if you want a big fancy car charger with advertising, you need a special permit. And then if you want to come in and install seven foot advertising, they can have a discussion with us. And if they want to install something that's going to blend in the landscape and support car charge and they can just do it. Because it seems like that's what everyone is worried about is having a, 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 a loophole to put objectionable, uh, bright, gaudy stuff where it impacts the, the feel of the center or the rest of the town. Do you, do you think affording the ability to come for a special permit for that advertising will um, will make it more palatable for people to develop them why why would what's what's the point of making that a special permit the advertising because then we would have some control over it 
Yeah, but that's the whole thing. With signage, you can't. Yeah, we could say we 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 could simply say that advertising is not allowed. So I just wonder why there's why why we would say if you want more advertising, you can just come back to us for a well, special permit. No, if you want any advertising, we allow people to put a sign up, but they have to come for the commission, right? But the sign is not advertising, though. The sign is just either a directional sign. It's a identification sign. It's not oh, saying, it's guess a, what? You know, Taco Bell is having a sale, and you can get five, to, you know, burritos and a chiquito for like you know three bucks. So, um, I mean, that's that's what I'm afraid of. I, you know, I don't I don't want to see something that's thrown on there because the manufacturer of the charging station has a deal with Subway. <laughs> So the, the regulation. Can I ask a can I ask a pretty naive question here? Sorry to enter. Um if do electric cars have GPS systems in them? Yes. So if you have a GPS system in your car and you're looking for a gas station, it'll tell you exactly where you can go for gas. So if you're an electric car owner. Can you hit the button and it says where you can go for recharging? Some yeah. models do. So have isn't that ever? I mean, what do they need advertising for? If, I'm not saying. I'm sorry, that's a really off the wall, naive question. Yeah, no, I'm not but saying. Why is there any advertising anyway for where you can get your car charged? Alice, it's not think... advertising for where you can get your car charged. It's advertising for other products. Alice, you need to watch a 30 second Taco Bell video. If, if I own a building in Kent, if I own the Kent Pizza Garden, and I want to, I want to put up a, an electric car charger, maybe I want to put up two or three. I don't want to pay to put them up. I want to put them up. So I call some vendor that offers them and they come and install them. They're getting paid for the advertising. That are on the car chargers. Just think of it as a billboard with a charger. This makes no sense. <laughs> Sorry, folks. <laughs> it's an advertising model to support the. Charger. I'm just having a real hard time that we're sitting here uh, advertising. If you need your car charge, it's not going to say that, Alice. It's going to say, "Come to Subway." So it's going to be a Joe Schmo. Well, we got to. Uh, you we clearly got to prohibit that well that's what mark is saying that, okay. we've got to pro saying. we got to prohibit that if i was thinking you're you're denying people the right to find a car charge no 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 third party advertising well that's not allowed okay so the <laughs> so we already have the the verbiage in our regulations um about signage that you can't have backlit signs. And that is what I believe uh, prevented the gas station for, from putting up the pumps that have the TVs and stuff attached to them that have advertising flashing on the screen. Is that is that correct, Donna? Yes. And thank so, you for that. Yeah. So that would that would that verbiage that already exists would also cover the car chargers. I don't know. I'd have to look at that and say not structures. I don't know. Right. So that I think that that's we already have this in place. So as we craft these a definition that's going to allow people to put these electric car chargers in that I think everybody in the commission is all for. Somehow, how do we connect or do we take that same verbiage and plug it into here? So that will curb the type of advertising that may go on these in the VR1 and VR2. And commercial. And commercial, yeah. You know, I think that, um, that, that every single location is different. Um, my concern is more that these are these are filling stations. Um, this is something where you go, you park, and and um, so there, there's more involved than just 
uh, advertising, it's, it's, it's parking, it's traffic, it's location. I mean, it's the kind of thing that begs a special permit to me, it, but, and not an outright um, um, right. It's not permitted outright. Seems like every case is different and, and, and would be different. I, I agree with you, Wes, and I also agree with some of the other comments. You know, we're a um, charming, I hate to use the word charming over and over, but we're a um, authentic uh, New England village. And I, I personally feel that these chargers should be off of seven. They should be in some of the parking lots or an area that is a bit more discreet. I, I would be concerned about losing the authentic architectural qualities of our town with these things running up and down Route 7. And the other concern is we're a, a little bottleneck town much of the time. And I think those would just tie up the town and the traffic further. If you're gonna uh, charge your car, you're gonna need time. And those should be in a place where, you know, it, it's not as sightly and it allows the car to have enough time to charge and you're not, you're not blocking up, you're not bottlenecking the town with it. I personally think, you know, David's right in 10 years, people are gonna go like, why? Why are they not on Main Street? Why? Because we're trying to preserve the, the you know, New England traditional character of our town. Now, I just, I'll say that the people don't come here to charge. They come here to do the things they would normally do, shop, eat, walk around. The charging is a side effect of leaving their car there while they're doing the other things. So it's, you have to switch the mentality a bit. You drive to a gas station to charge up or to gas up your car, but you charge where you happen to park to do the other things that you're doing. I, I yeah. would hate to see them on seven because it's going to take a while and you're gonna eliminate that constant switch of cars that are parked in front of Wilson's and Gifford's, um, you know, on, and you know, people just running in to pick up a cup of coffee somewhere. And so therefore to me, they don't belong on Main Street. And, and I, I think they would, especially with the with streetscape starting fairly soon, I'd hate to see streetscape making everything look beautiful and then having the car charges. So, I, you know, we're, we are a walking town. And so I think putting them in the shopping centers would encourage that, you know, you park the car, you get out, you walk, you're going to walk, you might not walk past, say, the Heron Gallery, if you were parked at the corner, but if you're parked, you know, in the back here, and you want to get to Kingsley's, you're going to walk past the Heron Gallery. So you know, it kind of gives you a little bit more walkability um, and more time to spend in the town to actually see what's going on there. Um, so that's why I'm looking at, you know, and I agree with Glenn, Glenn's recommendation was finding four separate locations um, in the town and kind of placing them in. I have a, a, another question that may be a little cog in this. Um, and how do we address for instance, if it, at the Kent Center um, in the middle of town, and they have a pretty good sized parking lot, and let's say they want to put up five electric car charging stations. So how does that affect the allocated number of parking spaces? Right. Or for the businesses there. Right. Where does that, because those people who are using those, those, that, that takes, that may or may not take away five parking places. I'm not sure how to look at that because you could say, well, they're going to park there. So they're going to walk into the Kent Village stores. That's what the parking lot is for. And they're going to, then they're going to walk into town, which the Kent Village, they don't like the people do there, but of course that's what everybody does. And, yeah. um, um, she used to come running out of the store. She did. She did. <laughs> if you took those two spots in front of her store, yeah. I'm in trouble. <laughs> but uh, I, mean, but then, we, I just wanted to bring that up to everybody. To I, I don't know how we deal with that, or if we deal with that. We we already see that in electric cars 
get one or two special slots right now in a lot of parking lots that remain empty because there's not a lot of electrical cars around yet. Um, I have a feeling that planning in general as an industry is going to take in some time to figure out exactly how this transition is going to impact things. You know, if you say put the electric cars in one place, we still have you still have gas cars parking in front of Wilson's, and then they might leave their car there and walk around. It's almost like the um, if you pretend that if if charges don't exist, if electric cars and gas cars are going to behave the same, the question is of electric. If charges do exist, does that somehow change the behavior of just the electric cars? I, I, I would almost suggest that maybe it doesn't. Like people are going to drive and park and do the things they do. The charging is a uh, is a side effect of what they would normally do. All right? You know, quaint New England towns. If it was really a quaint New England town, we'd have a bunch of horses. So I mean, now we have gasoline powered cars driving I mean, around and and motorcycles. So. Uh, it's it's um okay. uh, it, it just seems like it's an amenity to try to reduce the number of times cars are going to the gas station instead you know improving air quality and all the other things we're supposed to hopefully see out of this transition yeah it's it's a different case you go to the gas station you fill your car in four minutes you go to a charging station it takes you half an hour yeah. so, but you're not waiting there to charge you're parking there and then you're going and doing your stuff you're at Wilson's having your coffee, you're looking in the bookstore. I mean, I don't know of anybody, and I don't think there's any support for the idea that an uh, electric car driver is going to go somewhere just to charge in a quaint New England town. Right? They oh, do yeah. that in their garage. I, I think they're going to charge because they're out of juice. You're absolutely incorrect. When people are driving up from New York and going up to Massachusetts, they're going to be looking, where can I charge my car? not as a secondary thing to where they want to go shopping. They're looking for a charging station to, re, to recharge their car. And that's right. what I'm totally in favor of this, that we ought to have these charging stations in the parking lots at the, at the you know, uh, Kent Center Green or Town Green or whatever. Um, but if people are driving long distance, I think that's good. They're going to stop. They're going to park, charge their car. They're going to have dinner. 100%. That's why we should encourage it. Absolutely. But it's not secondary. People are, you, you seek out charging stations and then do your shopping where you can charge your car. That's partially that effect because they're still appearing everywhere. I think that starts to disappear as things as they are. Anyway, I, we're, we're going down a lot of rabbit holes here. We've got a lot of data question. to support their side. I have a question, David, because I'm not sure exactly how this works. But I'll use the Danbury Mall for an example because they have, I don't know how many charts, but they have, they have a pretty good number of, of chargers in their parking lot there. And um, I assume that you can't go and put your car in there and walk away for the day. That, that somehow the, you know, if you park in front of the charger, you're, you're paying to charge your car. And when your car is full, you, yeah, you, uh, you start getting, you get you pay a penalty pay by the minute, right? Yeah, you you but know that's how it works already. I mean that that yeah. that's how it works already. Yeah. That's but that was my question because I wasn't sure if uh, that's how it works. I don't know. If it I works just want to understand that. I don't know if it works that way universally. On Tesla, if you take your, your car to a Tesla supercharging site, uh, they charge they charge you a penalty uh, if you leave your car there more than two minutes after it's full. Yeah, okay. same with the other, all the other chargers that I'm aware of, it's the same thing unless they're free, like Whole Foods or something. But the ones in Danbury Mall, it's the same thing. They charge you, if you're if you're not there, they'll either get ticketed or you'll be charged. Yeah. It's like any other you know, parking rule. And not for nothing, <laughs> um, people do in fact look for charging stations when they're planning their trip. So if they're if they, if they want to drive from from Manhattan to the Berkshires and they they can only go 250 miles, they're going to look for a spot. And if we, there's no charging station in Kent that they can find, they're going to go to they're they're going to go up Route 22 and they're going to stop in Dover, right? So um, it's it's not just a question of of you know charging as, as Mark said, you're charging because it's a necessity. 
and you're going someplace, you're charging. If you're planning a trip, that's what you're doing. I agree with that. My brother has an electric car and when they go to Vermont or, you know, up to Maine, they, they know where they're going to stop before they go. Yep. And they, and they try to make it a nicer stop than, than just stopping at, at a rest stop along the highway where they have to kill a half an hour while the car charges, which is horrible. So they, they would drive to Kent on their way up to Vermont, not because I live here. And um, you know what I mean? You know, it's, it, they'll, I think people do, they map this out, they find a nicer place because they know they're gonna be stuck there for a period of time. So, so okay. we, we, we batted this around a lot and I don't know if, if it, Don, we've helped Donna in, uh, in, in solving um, this. Um, Not at all. <laughs> This regulation. Our, our work here is done then. But, but one thing that, that I feel that we should not do is exclude it as a, uh, a structure. Be, because that could proliferate. That, that means it could basically, it's not a structure, it can go anywhere. Right. Yeah. So, so I, I don't think that one is a direction that, okay. that we ought to take. What if we, what we if we a get a special permit? I mean, then, I you know, then so when somebody comes in, they can, they can come and say, and we can look at it and say, well, yeah, that's a good place. Or they want to put in three, you know, and the problem with leaving it as a structure is that it really precludes an, what might may be a really optimal place to put it. You know, it, it really, it limits that a great deal. I think when, <coughs> excuse me. I think when you start looking at it as a special permitted use, you're going to defeat all of the um, all of the emphasis that's being put on the use of electric cars. I think what they're, in other words, they're they're trying to make it as simple as possible for people to switch from a gas vehicle to an electric vehicle, and that means finding places to charge it and therefore letting people put them in as easily as possible instead of making them a special permit. That's True. just my take from all of the, the um, from all, all of the edicts that are coming down from government. Yeah, well, it, it may be easier, but there may be a lot of issues too. Right, so um, what I'd like to do um, is, have a con I have to talk to Glenn um, anyway, um, uh, about um, Club Getaway, and, and I can throw this on there as well, and let's see what he seems to think, and then maybe we can even get something checked off of the plan of conservation and development before it's even adopted. Now, there, now that's a plan. That's that, a plan, right? That's, so, a, that's a good plan. Um, and, you know, I think, you know, it was suggested that maybe it would be a good idea to create a subcommittee to um, to create regulations, since there's gonna be a lot of things that are gonna be kind of passed down the line. So that's something to think about. You know, just setting up kind of a, you know, a three or four person subcommittee to, to do like the initial work of creating, um, you know, regulations or changes to regulations. I wouldn't recommend it now until the housing affordability plan is done and the plan of conservation and development is done. So if you guys are, stretch pretty thin, thin right now. Um, and then maybe it'll be October and you guys can have a good My recommendation would be to table this and um, and and we can come back to it. I make a motion that we table this. Okay. I will second that motion. <laughs> I, I just had a question. So until we come back to this, you're gonna be regulating um, electric charging stations as a structure and subjecting them to setbacks? Pretty and, much. You know, Either that or they would have to go for a variance. And it seems like in the short term, most chargers are going to be self-selective about being in practical locations if you take the advertising away. But, um, you know, in most yeah. park, a lot of parking lots are on the edges of property lines. So if you want the chargers associated with a parking slot, you're going to be in violation of, you know, a setback on the parking lot. Right. Right, and that's what's driving this whole thing because the Kent School has, an, has a company that they want to put two of them in in the parking lot next to the facility building. 
but, and of course, the company is pushing it because they want to sell. I don't think that the Kent School is pushing it because, first of all, they're not in session yet. And, you know, they've gone this long, so they can wait a little bit longer. But I think that the charging company, the, you know, the, the manufacturer or the representative is the one that's pushing for the installation of it. Well, the school also wants to do it because, quite frankly, their parents come up oh, to bring their kids and see their kids. And a lot of them are in electric cars and they want them to be able to come to the campus and right. I think part of I don't think this car. was for the parents because of where it's actually located. I think this is for the employee. Okay. Well, yeah, well, just... I, I would definitely second the uh second the idea um of when we're talking about changing regulations to establish a subcommittee, which is where there's a, a fewer number of people who are running through all of the issues and talking it through and then having something to present to the to the full commission. I think that's I think that's I mean, yeah, I'm in favor of that. Okay. I'm too. I think that works well. Okay. Terrific. All right. So uh, all in favor of tabling. Okay. Uh, motion is tabled. So Adam, as I said i'm gonna to have to move on could you handle it from here i'll try okay i'll say good night right, wes. take care wes okay. so we have um we're on to new business yep to uh 6a1 application number 5722C and 5822SP, um, Michael Philo Earth Technologies for the South Kent School, 40 Bulls Bridge Road, map six, block 39, lot nine, installation of a ground mounted solar array. You wanna elevate somebody since Wes left as well? Um, yeah, I'll, I'll elevate Matt. And um, I can't malvate, um, elevate Rich because uh, it's the South Kent School. Right. So I'm going to take Rich and I'm going to throw him in the waiting. Okay. Bye. And I believe that Mike is here. And this is this is a public oh, hearing, isn't? This isn't is it? a public hearing, so there should be um, a legal notice. Um, yeah, that you would need to read into the record and then open the public hearing. Okay. Uh, do I have to You've got. Read it from hi, the top I can just read just just the public notice part on the bottom. Oh, she left. Okay, so um, uh. Town of Kent Planning and Zoning Commission Notice of Public Hearing. The Town of Kent and Planning and Zoning Commission shall hold a public hearing via Zoom meeting on Thursday, July 14th, 2022, beginning at seven o'clock p.m. to discuss the possibility and act on applications number 5722C and 5822SP, Michael Dent Deep, Penfilo, Earthling Technologies for South Kent School, 40 Bullsbridge Road, Map 6, Block 39, Lot 9, installation of a ground-mounted solar array. Any correspondence documentation will be attached to the agenda, which can be found on the town's website. At this hearing, persons may participate and may be heard. Uh, the Zoom meeting number can be located on the official agenda that will be filed with the town's web, town of Kent's website, a minimum of 48 hours prior to the official Zoom meeting. Adam Manis, Vice Chairman. And um, do I have a motion to open the public hearing or do I just open the public hearing? You're muted, Donna. Um, you can go ahead and just open the public. Okay, so I'm gonna open the public hearing at, 8.36 p.m. So um, why don't we uh, ask her, ask uh, Mr. Um, 
D. Panfillo to um, to talk to us about the application. Yes. Uh, first off, thank you to the committee for having us here today and to hear uh, about our project. Um, I'm going to talk about the installation uh, uh, and the overall scope of work, but I'm going to defer to my colleague, Stefan, uh, to talk about uh, a little background on the project. Okay. Hi, everybody. Stefan Hartman here because because of Rich's you know, recusal from this process, I've been working really close with Mr. Chavka over the last year, a little over a year, as the school has been exploring the solar project. So if there's any general questions about how they got here or motivations, um, I might be able to shed some perspective on that for the committee. So can you tell us about the... Um about the application and what does the school want to do? Yeah, absolutely. Sure. Uh, the, uh, Go I'm ahead, gonna Mike. Share, I'm gonna share my screen and uh, we can talk through the project. So these plans were submitted uh, along with the zoning application. Uh, this shows the plot uh, that South Kent School is based on it's a 150 acre plot and our proposed array location is centered just behind Gilder, Gilder Hall um, and the total array size is about 0.15 acres so it, although it is a ground mount array it is a, it is a modest um, here's a zoomed in site plan that shows the three arrays in the field behind Gilder Hall that is currently unused. And the, the, it's a, the distance from Gilder Hall is approximately 100 feet. Now these are three 100 panel arrays totaling uh, 138 kilowatts. Now these, uh, and I'll show just uh, another slide here. So the, Arrays themselves are fastened uh, via ground screw and they sit relatively low off the ground. Uh, they, the back edge is sitting around six feet. The array is interconnected into the Gilder Hall uh, electrical system and will be tied in with their existing PV array. Uh, now, this array is much larger than their existing. We're hoping to um, alleviate some of their electricity needs uh, with this. So, does this provide electricity for the whole campus or just for Gilder Hall? Just for Gilder Hall. And with that, um, if, unless Stefan has anything, I, I'll open it up to questions. You about covered it. Thanks, Mike. But I'm happy to answer any questions that might come up. The the, the legs of the structures they're gonna they're going to be set um, on footings. Is that correct? Correct. They're ground screws. Um, the the whole intention of our installation process is to, to disturb the least amount of, of earth as possible. So we do have a, an electrical trench that um, follows the you know, shortest distance from the array to the, to the actual building, um, but no large trenching will happen uh, in, in between the array here. It, it's just a, a ground screw going directly into the earth. What happens? I'm just curious. What happens with the with the ground screw if you hit a uh, if you hit a rock? Now that is a very common thing with ground mounted solar arrays, and and there are two main um, solar array ground mounted solar array installation practices, and and the ground screw actually alleviates some of that uh, bedrock issue. So with there the other way to install ground mounted solar is by pounding I beams into the ground. 
And when you hit bedrock, you have to pull the I-beam out, drill into the bedrock and reset the beam. With the ground screw, we're able to drill uh, into the beam and achieve the correct structural va uh, value. Does, um, does anyone else have any questions? Donna, do you have any questions? No, I'm good. Oh, you know, the only thing, the only question I have is what's the life um, expectancy for these, these solars? I mean, are they are they going to be putting in being there for you know indefinitely or like how long? What do they have to be switched out at any point in time? It is a great question. And solar panels they degrade very slowly uh, over a period of around anywhere from twenty five to around forty years. Uh, you're at year forty, you're not going to be producing nearly as much power, but you will still be producing power. There are other components of the system that will be need to need to change out, but they're much smaller components than the PV modules themselves. Uh, it is very common for PV modules to last 25 years. Thank you. Uh, I have a question. I'm just curious. Um, I don't really care what the answer is. Uh, will these arrays be fully visible from um, Bulls Bridge Road? They, no, they shouldn't be. They're behind Gilder Hall, and they're well um, into the interior of the campus. Well, this is exactly the kind of thing we're supposed to be encouraging. So, yeah, certainly in favor. Um, maybe uh, you can give us our screen back adam before um actually yeah you can i just about my, my question is um on the the three page pdf document that's titled uh hold on let me get there um the photovoltaic energy system south kent school that's that's on the first page there's a there's a blue uh line that shows some perimeter and i wonder if that's depicting the property line That is correct. I, I pulled that from the town GIS map. And that is depicting the property line of, of the South Kent school, as I understand it. Yes, that's right. So it's the, 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 the school then owns all of those agricultural fields up and behind, up on the hill, yeah. almost up to, to Berkshire Road, right? Yep. <laughs> okay. Um, and I'm, I'm sorry if you answered this question already. Um, how how far off the ground um, are these arrays in the front and in the back? I mean, on the low side and the high side, I should say. On the low side, we're looking at 32 inches, and in the high side, uh, 74 inches. Are they going to have to go out there and shovel them? No, the, the snow will, uh, it, it'll sit a little bit. There is a good tilt to them and it will, they'll, it'll slide off. So there, you do have some production in the winter. So some larger arrays will, you know, have mechanisms or people will shovel off of it, off of the array so you can produce more if there's sort of low tilt to an array, but it's not going to be needed in, in this case. And the and the the orientation of them is um, just is it due south? Correct. Yeah. The the optimal orientation for PV panels in our uh, latitude is is due, due south. And with a ground mount array, we're able to, to fully direct them that, that direction. 
and the topography there, um, we know that campus is on a hill. Does that hill go down? Does, is, is it full south or um, will the, the low side of, those, of that array be um, higher off the ground? than the 30 something inches that you said um, on one end because of the topography and the, and the, and the way the, that it's facing. The topography in that area is, um, there is some elevation as you move back to the, to the third array. Mm -hmm. The way that the racking company, or the, the way that we install this, um, they have the ability to, um, Kind of use the the installation to to map out the array as they go. So there will be some um, some areas where the 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 array will be slightly uh, higher than others. But the the overall goal is to keep the array as aesthetically pleasing as possible. So it st stays in a you know, if you're look, if you're standing in front of it and you're looking straight on, it will look straight. So naturally, if the topography of, of the location is um, rolling and it's relatively mild, um, there will be some natural height changes from the bottom of the array to the ground. And I'll add that the the lower edge of the array isn't necessarily level. It's like Mike said, there's usually there's it's a we're striking a balance between keeping it um, straight while still tracking periodically with any undulations in the ground, but it won't follow every undulation of the earth. We'll we'll have to um, find a happy medium. But the the land back there does elevate south to north. So the arrays are actually going to be going uphill as we go from the front row to the back row, which is favorable in a, in a system like this. Thanks for that. I'm sure that I don't have to ask this. I'm sure the school has been incredibly careful, but I feel remiss if I don't ask about the safety of them. Um, it's a boys' school. My son went there. I know it well. And uh, I look at those and I look at, wow, what a great place to run across and um, and jump off the back. So I just I need to ask you about that. Um, the in terms of tamper proofing, any electrical wiring is tucked in and enclosed. Uh, and, and designed, it, it's kind of a code requirement to make sure that it's it's safe and relatively tamper proof. Um, like you said, you know, the very adventurous boys, if they want to climb up on top, we're not going to be doing anything to prevent that from happening. I think that the school is going to have to enforce their own, um, you know, controls. Uh, but the system itself would, uh, as, as Mike said, it's a gentle slope, you know, about two and a half feet on the front end and about six in the back. So it's it's not so steep that there's a real hazard to somebody falling off, but if if a boy got up there and, and bounced around, I mean, they could cause damage to the panels. Sure. Um, so we're, we're hoping that doesn't happen. Um, Is that so? But, it, they, sorry, but there wouldn't necessarily be an electrical risk okay. uh, in that case. Do you are you using micro inverters or do you have three main inverters for the strings? There are string inverters uh, okay. on this system. How many? There are, you speak there are eight string inverters. Okay. And they're just mounted on the side under the array? Correct. We'll have a couple extra uh, ground screws and, and then we mount them to the back of the array, tucked behind uh, typically electrical equipment uh, is, you know, trying to hit it as much as possible. If I was to say that there was one, one kind of tamperable device on the system, it's the safety disconnect switch. So the one thing that somebody could mess with would actually shut the whole system down and make it as safe as possible. Thank you. 
and that's easy, you know, that's that's easy to operate for obvious reasons. Does anyone else have um, any questions or concerns that they want to bring up before we close the public hearing? Uh, once we do, we can't get any other information. So, Adam, I th I think that your point is well taken. Um, you know the the um, the array that we approved up at Marblewood, both of them had uh, had had fences around them. They weren't tremendous fences, but they were certainly uh, deterrent fences. Um, so it might be worth it, it might be worth suggesting um, a fence. It is. It I means literally right behind a dorm. Yeah, that's the fifth form, right? I think so. Yeah. I suppose that can always change, but I think so. Yeah. A fence might not be such a bad idea. The, the Fronius 12K inverters, right? They can be yeah. opened fairly easily. And I think that, as I recall, they have controls on them unless you can lock them out. Because boys will be boys. Um, so. I mean, I think it would be a good idea if you guys discuss with the school, and I think it would be good for the school to do something to help prevent the boys from um, their new jungle gym. But um, but I think that's for the school to uh, to do, and I'm sure that, and I'm I have no doubt that the South Kent School will do what they have to do to to keep the we boys. we we did discuss a fence. Uh, with the school, um, it, it's it's it, you know it's it's a pretty standard option. It does happen sometimes. Um, they have opted not to include the fence. I think aesthetically, it's better without it. But they do know that if there was ever a tampering issue or a concern that could grow, there's nothing that prevents them from adding it and enclosing the array with a fence or some kind of shrubbery that could you know make it you know uh, uncomfortable for for kids to get back there. You know prickly bushes, if you will. Um, so there's there's a myriad of solutions that could be employed down the road if they observe a problem. Okay. At least that's how the discussion went. Great. Then if there's nothing else, if anybody, nobody else has anything to say, then I'll uh, ask for a motion to close the public hearing. I'll move we close the public hearing. Second. All in favor? Um, the public hearing is closed at 8.54 p.m. There are waivers. Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. So now, um, we have an application before us. We've got waivers before you before you move to accept the application. Yeah. So they have yeah. traffic study, water. Uh, they actually gave us a site plan with the location of everything. Right. So I think it's the things that are highlighted. So three, six, seven, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, and thirteen. So do I have a motion for those waivers? Yeah, I'll move that we grant the waivers uh, as requested in document 681. A second? A second. Who was that, Matt? Yes, Donna. Thank you. I think it was 5, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, right? So uh, we didn't say 14, no, it's just 13. I don't see a 14. Maybe not. We're done with a special permit checklist, right? Are we talking about? Well, I'm looking at the site plan application checklist. Look at the site plan application. I'm, sorry, I'm on the wrong one. Yeah, so it's uh, three, six, seven, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13. So I think that that's what the initial, at least I thought that's what the initial motion was for. Yeah. Okay. 
And Matt, you agree with that? You seconded it. Yes. Any discussion? Uh, then all in favor, please uh, raise your hand or say aye. Aye. So motion granted. Um, and then there's a, is there a second set of waivers? No. Okay. Yeah, so it would just now be the application itself. Okay. So um, discussion on the, on the application. Or a motion to accept the application. Um, I would uh, make a motion to accept application numbers 52-22C and 50, I'm sorry, um, and 58-22SP, uh, Michael D. Panfilo, um, Earthlight Technologies for South Kent School, 40 Bulls Bridge Road, Map 6, Block 39, Lot 9, Installation of Ground Mounted Solar Array System. I will second that. Any discussion? All in favor, raise your hands or say aye. Uh, motion granted. Okay. So your um your application was accepted. You're all set. Thank you very much. So what will happen is um, I have to put a notification in the newspaper. Um, today is Thursday. Probably will go in either Saturday, Sunday, or Monday, depending on what the newspaper decides. Um, and then once it goes in, it's 15 days from that time period um, that you can apply for your zoning permit and then apply for your um, building permit. You do need to contact Farmington Area Health. Um, they're going to they're gonna want to see where you're putting this. Um, I did talk to Kathy, so if you want to give me a call tomorrow, I can give you her contact information. She's on vacation this week and will be back in the office on Monday. Great, I'll give you a call tomorrow, Donna. Okay, sounds good, Mike, thanks. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay, so on to um, 6B1, establishing a hiring subcommittee for a land use administrator position. I don't know why we're doing this. We should just not accept. Sorry. Any resignations at all. <laughs> it should be subject to vote. But and seeing how it's not, we do have to. Uh, we do have to um, establish subcommittee. So. Um, I did talk to Wes this afternoon. Um, I, I did create a hiring subcommittee um, in Inland Wetlands um, with Lynn Werner um, as chairman of Inland Wetlands and um, Paul Gagan. <clears throat> Lynn thinks that it would be good to, all, to have the chairman. And so I did ask Wes and, and Wes said that he would like to be on. Yes, he would do it. So we just need one more person unless you feel that you want to have more than two people on this subcommittee. I think, um, unless anybody else feels differently, I think you know it. Um, two people is good because it all it all will come to um, the commission. But if but if we have three commissioners that want to be on it, then we can have three commissioners. Um, does anybody have an opinion about this? Three is fine. Three is fine too. I think, I think, I think one more. more. That's, what I, that's what I was going to say, Mark. You should, you should get at least one more. <laughs> I'm oh. sorry, Adam. Um, aren't we, isn't PNZ a lot larger commission than Inland Wetlands? Um, yeah, Inland Wetlands has um, seven members. Planning and zoning has 10. So I just, maybe we should have three. I'm fine with three. It was, um, I think that works. I like, I like an odd number. Um, so Wes is, Wes is the first one. We need two more. Do I hear any volunteers or do I get to a point? <laughs> Alice, I think you'd be great at it. Alice, I think you should, you should be on the committee. Just you do. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, 
Okay. Okay, so we have Alice and- Well, I mean, you're the only one. Maybe nobody else thinks that. <laughs> oh, no, you're good. I think Alice would be great at it. Yeah, you're great. Um, does anybody else want to be on this <laughs> committee or anybody else volunteering for it? I'm happy Come on, Daryl. <laughs> I have seen a bunch of uh, land use enforcement officers, so I'll, I'll do it. That's great. Yeah. Okay, so we have Wes, Daryl, Alice. Super. We don't have to make a motion for that, right? That's just... Um... No, no, you do. You have to make a motion for the creation of the subcommittee whose sole purpose is to interview and find a replacement for the current land use administrator and make that presentation to the Board of Selectmen for final, for, for confirmation. Okay, so I need somebody to make that motion, please. So it's right from the subcommittee to the Board of Selectmen? Or... So it, the subcommittee makes the decision yeah. And then they bring their decision to the Board of Selectmen so that the Board of Selectmen can go ahead and extend the offer. They're not going to bring it to the rest of the commission first? No, they don't have any jurisdiction over us, uh, um, the hiring of this position. Okay. No, what they mean is, the, uh, is, is that the subcommittee is not going to go back for maybe even tacit approval to the full Planning and Zoning Commission before they make the recommendation to the... To the uh, Board of Selectmen. That's up to you guys. You know, I mean, if that's if you would like to do that, you can. I would expect that it would, the subcommittee would at least run it past everybody, so we all know what's okay. going on before it goes. I would, through. I would agree with that. Okay, all right. So then it would go to the, it would go to the selectmen. It would go to the first selectmen from the the entire plan of uh, planning and zoning commission, as opposed to the subcommittee. Okay. Okay. I, I think so. You know, the, 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 the mechanics for that could be that, uh, you know, from the subcommittee to subcommittee comes back to the, to the full commission for approval. And then the subcommittee makes the recommendation to the planning and zone, to the board of selectmen that, that, that could work too. So I the, actually, I think that's, I think that's a better way. I, I kind of thought that that's what it would have been. You know, I just thought that the subcommittee would, would present, present what they found and in, in their choice. To, to the whole commission so we can all give our head nod. Okay. Then And then the subcommittee would then go to the selectmen um, and uh, and as a sub subcommittee, give it to them. Okay. I'll make a motion. Okay, Matt. We have a second. Second. Thanks, Mark. Any discussion? All in favor? Raise your hand, say aye. Passed. And then um, do we have to nominate the three people or, or that's done, we've already appointed them or do we have to make a motion to appoint um, Wes and Alice? And the, the name, the na I'll put the names in Matt's motion. The creation of the subcommittee consisting of Wes, okay. Adam, and, and, and uh, I mean, Wes, Alice, and Daryl. Okay, sure. and that's great. And, and Matthew, that's good with you. Is that motion is amended like that? And um, that's that. That's how I intended in, intended my motion, Adam. So yeah, that's that's fine with me. And whoever uh, was the second, you're good with that too. That was Mark. Was the second? Oh, Mark. So yeah. you're good with that also. Yes. Okay, great. Then we're all okay. set. Um, so what's going to happen now is. Um, I would like to be able to post the, the opening the week of July 18th on the town's website and leave it sitting there for about two weeks. Let's see what kind of responses we get. And then I, I'll decide whether or not, I'll let you guys know, I'm not gonna make the decision in the vacuum as to whether or not um, you, know, you wanna put it on Indeed based on the responses that we get from the posting on the town's website. Um, both Lynn and, um, Actually, me, both Lynn, me, and Paul are going to be on vacation the first week in August. So um, the second week in August, I'll have an opportunity to look to see what I've received and then 
uh, you know, forward them around to you guys, and then we can set up some kind of subcommittee uh, meeting to review the applicants um, via Zoom. Is there a an association of land use administrators that we could post this to? Um, no, I can post it on the list serve, and then there's the Connecticut Association of Zoning Enforcement Officers, um, and we can and we can put it on. I can put it on the Casio website. Yep. Okay. Okay. So. Um, 6B2, the reappointment of ARB members, Ellen Corsell and Peter Hanby to two-year terms ending August 2nd, 2024. And I, I would make that motion to, uh, to reappoint both of those members um, to two-year terms. Second. Um, Pete Hanby is, uh, is the, you know, Ellen is the chair. Yeah. Um, and she, 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 she does a good job. And Pete Hanby is the, uh, is the architect on the on ARB? So we need him. Happy that he's uh, re-upping. Yeah. Well, we need. I think we we have to have one architect. Correct. If I remember correct. So, um, so any discussion beyond that? Just uh, thanks to them both. And, and thanks for yeah. I mean, they really uh, we need them there, and that's great. And uh, thanks to both of them. And um, so, all in favor, raise your hand or say aye. Uh, motion passed. And then um, 6B3, update on application 19-16C, Vincent W. Forsey uh, for Scott Mackenzie at Zero Kent Hollow Road. So this is that huge undertaking that had, has been on um, Upper Kent Hollow. And I just wanted, um, I had gotten a complaint. Um, so I did call uh, Vinny and said, oh, we haven't really chatted in a while. So what's been going on there? Um, and um, he, he told me um, that he is not the sole, that the trucks that are coming through Upper Kent Hollow are not coming just for him that there is other truck work that's being done in the area. Um, and that um, he is now at a point in the project where they are topsoil and seeding. Um, the upper pond is complete, so that's all done. They're working on this hillside um, from the upper driveway to the lower access driveway. He's put down um, a bunch of topsoil that has now been seeded and is covered with erosion matting. Um, from there, they're going to go to the hill for the lower access driveway to just ab above the lower pond. Um, and once that's all graded and, um, and filled with topsoil and seeded, um, he's going to then start working on the, um, on the pond. Um, the pond had silted in because he really hadn't been working on the project because he was busy working on the house that Mr. Matthews was building on the lake. Um, they did call in Arthur Howland, who came and looked at the pond, and he, um, you know, they basically said, don't touch it, leave it as a silting pond, so everything is being caught there. Once he gets done doing his um, topsoil and seeding, um, anchoring, he's going to then um, get a permit to clean out that pond and then get that pond up and running. Um, he said they've, um, he only brings topsoil in Monday through Wednesday. Um, and his topsoil drivers have been instructed to go slow and not use the Jake brakes, um, which is something that evidently makes a lot of noise. Um, and, um, you know, he's, he, he had a big truck there today um, of, filled with water. He said everything is dry and all the seeds that he put down, um, the seeding is just not, not germinating. So he brought in a tanker today to spray that down. Um, so, you know, hopefully he said he'll be done soon. Donna, is that the same complainant um, who we heard from, it's got to be four years ago now, right? Yeah. Yeah. Yes. No, it, this is somebody else. So when, 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 when we had that complaint, whenever it was ago, um, right. we made it pretty clear, I thought to them that number one, they couldn't they couldn't be using that property for, um, for storage of material. Um, and that they were from, from the house that they were building on the lake. 
And then I, th I thought that we told them that, uh, that they had to be done within a certain period of time. I don't know if we told them they had to be done within a certain period of time. We did tell them that, you know, he couldn't. I mean, I'll, I'll check the file. Yeah. Yeah. This was back in, there was a note to the file in 2019. Um, I thought, I, if I remember correctly, maybe I'm remembering a different time, Matt, but I, I kind of thought the way it, it ended was we were just kind of almost mediators between the between the Maxi and his guy and and the uh, and the neighbor and and the the trucker was was you know it, it was forcey forcey was very good and he. Um, you know, he he told them and ensured them and he would not be trucking uh, during the times so it was really disturbing them. Right, right. And so, I, I didn't think we we made any decisions about what they could or couldn't do that I remember. Yeah, no. Well, after checking the file on the regulations, I found that the permit was granted in 2016 was for a filling operation. 4,000 cubic yards of fill from the Lake Warmud property removal of 2,500 cubic yards from the Kent property back to the Lake Warmug property and the remainder of the 1,500 cubic yards to remain on the Kent property. They agreed to that. And I believe that that's what they did. So right now what he's doing is he's just, now they're at the point where they're top soiling um, the, um, all the hillsides, securing them, um, preventing them from eroding by planting them and putting the uh, erosion mats on top. So how long, how, how long are they, it does a special permit last? Is it? It's not, it was not a special permit. Um, it was just the, the only reason that they got a permit, according to the regulations, you can, you can move dirt around on your property for as long as you want. But what comes into play is a mount coming off or a mount going in. And, and so that's what we pulled the permit for, was for, was for that regulation, because he was using that area to take care of the dirt that was coming off of the property that Matheson bought over on Lake Warren. So what sort of permit was that that we granted? That was, I think it was just a site plan. And a, and, a, and a site plan has no expiration date. Yeah. So right now what he's doing, he can bring in the fill now for agricultural purposes. And that's what he's doing. So they can bring in, not about which. <laughs> um, sorry, Rich. <laughs> Hi, Rich. So I'm sorry, let me just ask one, one more question, Adam. The, 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 so so the, the site plan application that we granted is, is, is in essence closed now, right? It has been closed? Yes. So this is, so, and, and what they're doing, they have, they, they, have, they have by right to do. Yes. Okay. Yep. Because there's no, there's no um, amount of, of fill that you can bring in for agricultural purposes. But is it, I mean, is it really agricultural? Yeah. I mean, when they get done, Brent Kalstrom is putting his cows there. Yeah, the plan was to bring this back to, uh, if I remember correctly, the, the, they had a plan of, of kind of bringing this back to, all back to farmland. You know, um, however that was going to be done so um okay well if that's the, i mean if that's that's the if if that's the intent and that's what we were being told i i, I think that's that word we're, we're not that's it i mean honestly i, I don't and i don't know if daryl remembers at all the, when this uh application first came before us i i don't i certainly don't remember that that we were saying okay to to a project that was going to be this long and that was going to leave a huge hillside 
on Kent Hollow Road, um, barren for for ten years. Mm -hmm. Well, it's not that long, but I think we were mostly concerned with the active and intensive trucking of material back and forth to Lake Warmog, and you know they did mention that they were going to return this to a state to have cattle in it. So, yeah. well, it has been eroding pretty consistently since I've been living here. Right. I it's and very significant with some of the larger gully washers we've been having. Yeah, I did go, I drove by after one of the larger um, uh, storms that we had, because I'm actually looking at the piece of property across the street now. Um, <clears throat> but um, there was a huge gully that has since been filled in, um, uh, topsoiled and seeded um, with the erosion that put on it. So that, that one has been corrected. And the, and, and the topsoil, if I'm understanding, um, is coming from off site, but still yes. it's, it's agricultural use and it's agricultural use. Right. And they have a wetlands exemption too. <clears throat> so what would you like us to do? Um, nothing. I, I am bringing it forward to you because I'm leaving. So I just want you to know that if somebody comes back with a complaint, I did talk to Mr. Miner. I've been actually having numerous conversations with Mr. Miner from across the street. Um, he no longer has an issue with uh, Mr. Mathesee or with Mr. Ferrisi and um, is very happy with how everything is looking right now. So I just wanted to, to get a baseline because we hadn't had one. Um, and so um, I've been chatting with Vinny um, about what's going on there. And I've also been chatting with Vinny about what's going on across the street. So. That might end up being um, a notice with an injunction. So we'll have to see. What What's across the street? Uh, somebody put in a driveway and they clear cut it a uh, quite a swath of uh, of hillside. They're not in the horizon line, but um, I talked to the guy twice on the uh, once on the phone, and I did send him a letter and said, you, and I, you know, you have to stop doing what you're doing right now. Um, and then I called the tree guys were there today and I did call them and told them you are stopping work right now until the property owner gets in touch with me. So we'll see what happens tomorrow. Okay. But take a ride through there and go down to the bottom and look up on the hill. But yeah, Alice is on, you're on mute, but I'm reading your lips that it's very, very noticeable. It's hard to miss. Yeah, yeah. Oh. And and having those uh, tr trucks go by with the dirt back and forth whenever that was, this is nothing. What well, the trucks that are they've been going back and forth recently are nothing. Right. Okay. They should be in terms. I mean, in terms of numbers or noise or brakes or activity, it it's minor. And I think some of those trucks, as somebody mentioned, have something to do with the construction going on on a new property over in Kent Hollow. I don't think they all have to do with Mackeson. Right. That's what he said. He said they're not mine. So yeah, yeah. Um, but that's that's that. Okay. okay. So um, there's nothing for us to do there. Thank you, Donna. Um, six before this is a preliminary discussion. Uh, Virginia. Bush Sut Sutman, 8 Bluff Road, map 19, block 15, for a conversion of a detached boathouse to an accessory dwelling. And I believe Virginia is here. I am indeed. Uh, let me do a gallery so you can see me somewhere here. There I am. Um, I am so fascinated. Once a year, I like to watch one of your one of your meetings with all that big stuff. <laughs> You're amazing. Uh, I've come with a tiny thing. I want to put somebody in my barn to live. I have this, I have this property that has uh, a two family house and a barn which was renovated recently. It was built originally in, in 1989 as a boathouse, and I renovated it in, well, finishing in 21, to an office, which I no longer need as an office. And since there are so many people who need homes, 
It's a nice studio apartment. I think you saw pictures of it. And it's uh, nicely fitted out. And I'd like to be able to rent it. The only problem is the regs do not permit that. There, there are a couple of problems. The regulations say you can have a detached dwelling unit uh, on a property with a single family house. Well, I happen to have a, a two family house because I already have an accessory apartment, uh, which I rent to somebody who needs a home. So what I'd like to do is provide another home for somebody else. And uh, as I said in my letter, Donna has suggested that because the property itself, oddly enough, is in both the uh, village center and the rural district that I changed the, change the property line into two, two separate properties, uh, drawing a line across that. I have asked Gary Hawk to get a, a uh, survey for that, but uh, Gary doesn't work that fast. But I would would do that. I, I have a question. If you if you made it two um, lots, um, you would have a problem with your septic because you can't have a shared septic. I am on the town sewer. You're on the town sewer okay. and town water. Okay. So that the uh, the if if the property is dividing, the one in the rural area would have would share my septic and town water. Uh, it would be a quarter of an acre, uh, which is not uh, what is listed for the rural zone is an is a an acre. But that's because of septic, but I don't need a septic. I've got one. I put it in to go to that, that barn. So that's one possibility. There's another possibility is that if you do not feel that the necessity for, a, as written in the regs, is that an accessor, uh, Accessory separate dwelling unit can only be added to a property that has a single family house. I do not understand why that is a necessity since my particular house is smaller than most single family houses by two families. Uh, so that would be uh, one way of viewing it as a possibility. Another would be that uh, it uh, <coughs> is regarded as a multifamily property. <coughs> there are several multifamily properties uh, in the uh, village center, uh, residential, uh, two on Elizabeth Street and uh, some others around town. There would be, again, something which would simply be waiving that restriction uh, that it has to, that you can't do a multifamily in the uh, in the uh, village center. Uh, despite the fact that there are several that have been there for a long time and several uh, that uh, <clears throat> are probably grandfathered. And so what I'm asking for is a tiny little change of, of definition. Uh, nothing will change visibly, except that I will add parking places. The building is already there. Nothing will change in the footprint. The services are all already there. Nothing will change in that. All I want to do is offer somebody a studio, nice studio apartment to live in. You're probably aware that a number of apartments in town <laughs> have recently been bought and are being upgraded. The one on 13 Lane Street, gossip tells me they're going to charge 1800 for those apartments. 
that's not particularly affordable. Uh, the people who live there did not make that kind of money. The same is probably true of the eight units behind uh, behind 81 North Main, the, the Kent Victorian, which is being extensively renovated too. So I, all I'm asking is that somebody else can live here in this nice place. Exactly the way it is built now. So I, I think we, we get it uh, and probably everybody is fine with that, but I, I'd like to ask Donna, um what uh, you know what you think is the the best or cleanest way for virginia to um to move forward on this i, I read her letter and then the the different her different options but i'm not sure what what you think is the best way for her to go i mean i i i think I think we need to get a site plan from Gary that shows the delineation of the village center residential and the rural break. Where is that? Because you need to figure out the structure that you're looking at. Where is it actually located? In the village center residential or in the rural district? Um, and then I think we need to look at if it can't be if it can't be split because it doesn't meet the minimum lot requirement. Can we waive that minimum lot requirement? Because like she says, the lot requirement is there because of the septic. So um, if, you know, I don't know if we can, if legally we can do all of it. So, and if, if we can't do any of that, then it would be looking at a regulation change and changing that, that one word that says single family, two family. Or taking that requirement out of there altogether. So, so there's Sorry. really, in the end, there's really nothing at all we can do. And, and I don't even know that it's even worth having any discussion right now until we get the site plan from Gary, which will give you and give this commission some direction on what the best way would be for Virginia to, to be able to do this. I, I mean, I don't want to talk for everybody, but I, I don't think anybody has a problem with, with what she wants to do. And I, I think it's great that she wants to provide an apartment and, and housing for somebody that they can afford. Um, so on the other side of town, I'm sorry, Don, on the other side of town um, where we've got both properties in both the, the, the village center commercial, the village center residential and the, and the rural district, we've got that 1440 line, right? And the 1440 line is, is is a real is a real delineation because the steep slopes get the slopes get steeper above that 1440 line. Right. On the other side, um, there doesn't seem to be that delineation between the the rural zone and the and the the village center residential zone. Um, it's I think at one point in time what it was was the boundary of the river. That's the only thing that I can think of. We wouldn't want somebody to be living in the floodplain, right? So what does the floodplain mean? Is it the 100-year floodplain? And where does that go? Where's that line? They um, don't. You know what? This, this building, so the, this is the well, boathouse, boat right, Virginia? Hold on, Virginia. So this is the yeah, boathouse. Can I yeah? tell you so, a few more things about oh, that? Oh, can you wait, Virginia? Virginia, can you wait? Because we're having a discussion. Sure, so I didn't realize. This the, this boathouse sits at the very top of the hill. Then, yeah. you know, it actually spans the hill. And I'm wondering if it isn't almost half in the rural zone and half in the in the VR1. Because it, be. it, goes, it goes down fairly steeply right behind it. Um, yeah. So, it, so I'm sure that it's not in the floodplain. I'm sure the floodplain... And you know, when Virginia did the renovations and um, I know the house, I know the property from before Virginia owned it, they, they didn't have to do anything with floodplain um, construction or anything. It's, it's I, do have a, I do have the floodplain on some plan here, but I didn't put it in the packet. But I will say 
to, to work against my own my own pitch here. That lower part, this is Bluff Road. And where the house is, where my garage is, where this boathouse is, it's all on the level with Bluff Road. Then it drops maybe 20 feet. And then More it's, that, well, <laughs> it drops a lot. And then it's flat down there by the river and it floods there every winter. So if I were to divide that into a separate property with a single family house, what provided that the property line allows for it, it would be a house in the middle of a flood. <laughs> I don't really want to divide it that way. I Furthermore, that. I, wouldn't, I wouldn't suggest that. I wouldn't suggest <laughs> subdividing the property. I would suggest moving the line. Um, so Donna, let me ask you this. Uh, the, uh, Go ahead. Oh, interesting. Okay. No, no, big, well, the only problem becomes you've got Bluff Road in there. Yeah, but I'm, just, I'm looking through the regulations now with regard to the village of the, the permitted accessory buildings in the in the village center residential districts. And, and, and this would be a lip if all of this property were in the village center residential, what Virginia wants to do would be permitted if I read it right. Is that correct? Yeah. So the simplest thing to me would be to, to figure out where, as, as, as Virginia and Donna said already, to figure out where that line is. And if we need to move the line, because if it's outside the if it's outside the flood zone, then let's 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 have it wh where it should be in the village center or residential. That's I was going to suggest that exact thing. It's easy and straightforward. But that's what that's why I said at the beginning. I, I don't know that there's much of a discussion for us to have right now because we can't make a discussion. We can't really have a real discussion about this until Gary gives us a site plan that shows us. This show That's right. Answer. Absolutely. And, and, and you know, David and I were just trying to steal your ideas all. So part of the property is in a 100 year and what part of the property is in a five? Of the whole property. Uh, but not not necessarily the building. I don't think I don't think no, the building. Oh. oh. The you know the the, the boat house. The boathouse is a boathouse. It, there it is. is. You know, to hold the boats for the for the South Kent School Bus. Yeah. So and then, and then it was Braden's and we would use it at one point. Right. So that is if you I I haven't the floodplain, the hundred year flood runs right through the line of the Boathouse barn. The 500 year flood is, an, is another 10 feet, let's say, towards Elizabeth Street from that. So. But the uh, thing is that let's look at it in plan view. And the reality is that this building is above the floodplain. If you, you look have to down figure at out what the elevation is, right, Adam? Yes, the elevation is higher than the floodplain. It's just, you know, the half of the building, you know, the buildings that grade. And you see this side, at but all? the other side, you know, the other side is on is on legs that that have it 15 feet off the ground. Yeah, here's here's the flood lines right there. That square there is the boathouse. There are the flood lines. So the, the building the itself home. isn't really, you know, it's above the it's above the. the okay, and, and and I mean, it's not that you can't build in it. You would just, you know, and everything is. It's not that you. Everything on the inside is already above it. Yeah. Um, so I, I agree. I think that what we need to do is wait to see what Gary has pulled together. Let's see if we can't move that. So you're saying move the the designation of the VR, then you have to do a zone change as opposed to a lot line change. Yeah, which is considerable. I, I, I don't know that it is considerable just because, we're, because we're really talking about a, a, an, an existing condition, right? 
we, yeah. we would run the risk of saying, well, everybody along that, that, that floodplain line could build and they, they, they could build up on stilts and be considered in the rural zone all the way down. You know, so we could extend, in essence, extend for your neighbors, extend the rural zone all the way out to the river as long as we built up on stilts, which we probably don't. <laughs> on stilts, yes. Well, there's some houses on Johnson Road that are in that, that level part down by the river. Right there, but they're in the rural zone and they're not looking to have. Uh, uh, they're in the rural zone. All right, so let's, so Virginia. Right. Virginia, let's do this. Let's wait to see what Gary comes back with. Okay. In the meantime, I would invite any of you to come and look at the property itself. Because even with the pictures I put, I don't think you can quite understand the three dimensions. And I'm not sure that the three dimensions work to my advantage, but. <laughs> okay. I think that it, 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 it would. I think it would let everybody see how the building is and how high it is above, of, above where, and if, where if the you go, is. So it certainly if, isn't a bad idea. If you go down to the patio underneath, you will see the steel beams that hold it up, which are considerable. So, uh, but don't come right now because I've got COVID and I'm going to be in quarantine for a little longer. Oh. <laughs> or don't knock on my door, just go down there. And don't go more than two people or more than one person. You can't go two together because then it's a meeting. Right. When, oh. when was this? When was the building built originally? Does anybody know? Mr. <laughs> Mr. Braden built it, or he the, used that spot and constructed the the boathouse. It and it's cantilever. It's, it's cantilever. It's cantilever, so he could drop the boats through the floor. Yeah. Yeah, which like when? And the floor has all been remade and re. I don't you know, know when. Bill Braden no. loved that boathouse. But, yeah. but the, so is it sixty-seven? Is it fifty? Is it eighty? Oh, it's, it was just a shed. I, I I don't know. I mean, it really was just a shed. But you when know? does it predate? Does it nineteen eighty-nine? Nineteen eighty-nine. The house dates nineteen thirty-eight. Yeah. The boathouse dates nineteen eighty-nine. All right, so it's on the survey not, there. Yeah, you know. it's not. It's not pre-existing the regulation. No. So it's, it's, if it doesn't if it doesn't predate the the the, the separation of the, the the zone, then that doesn't work. It would have been easy, you know. It's, yeah. Okay. Let's. Yeah, let's well, yeah. Don is right. Let's I mean, wait to other, see what uh, has to say. I would just give it to somebody if I could, but I if somebody lives there all winter, the electric is pretty expensive for the for the mini split HVAC. So. Okay. Uh, charge minimal for it. So I'm really just asking the ability to charge enough to make it not a loss for me. <laughs> well, we really appreciate your efforts to uh, to provide housing, uh, Virginia. I mean, you've been doing it for so long. and um... Well, I've loved working with you to do that over the last 15 years. Yes, <laughs> and this is my last small gesture. <laughs> you said that the last time, Virginia. <laughs> and we'll see if we can work something out. So, Virginia, thank you very much. <laughs> thank you. No um, better. So it's late, so I'm going to try to push us forward. Um, somebody wants to go on vacation. Yeah, um, I'm going to be gone from the 31st until August 5th. I'll be back um, in the office on the 8th. Okay. So after this, Donna, how many more how many more vacation days do you have? Well, this is actually this year's vacation, but I have um, thirty five days, so I'll have thirty days left. Wow! <laughs> so you better you better start taking them. No, they're going to pay me out. Oh, okay. Plus, what whatever I have carried over, because I can carry over five days a year, so. Okay. You might be going on an extended vacation. All right. Um, and then um, the, um, I'll be out of the office half a day on the 21st. I'll be doing the Planet Conservation and Subdivision meeting from Essex, Connecticut, from the Griswold Inn, if anybody's been there. 
um, because I have a Casio meeting the next day at nine o'clock in the morning um, in the uh, at the Saybrook Point Resort. So uh, we're going to go down and spend the night down there, and then so I'll be doing the meeting on the twenty-first from there. The uh, the supposed meeting on the twenty-first. We have right, the supposed yet. meeting. I hope. It, yeah, but, I mean, you know, seems like the twenty-first would work. Yeah. I don't know. But that we can discuss that as we get to the POCD subcommittee. So, um, <clears throat> okay, what do I got? So then, uh, 8A, the POC subcommittee. I don't, there's really nothing for us to, uh, there is there was, anything for us to discuss? Are we going to discuss the, the, the results of or, or the notes from the meeting? So I would I would jump in and say it's, um, very quickly that's the so we, we, we I think the meeting that we had um, at, at the end of June went really well. Um, uh, it's Glenn has come up with um, his comments and suggestions for the POCD subcommittee. He's got those in a in a format that he's going to send out. If he hasn't already, he's going to send out to the four of us, the five of us, right? You'll get that tomorrow morning. I got it late tonight. Okay, fine, fine. So. Um, then the next steps are um, that the POCD subcommittee is going to have a meeting, hopefully on the 21st, if that works for everybody. I'm hoping that works for everybody because that works for Glenn. That's a week from tonight. When, the 21st? Yeah. yeah. Okay. And um, we suggested, you know, we said that either 5.30 or 6. So we can, Donna, do you want to decide that now? Yeah, this way I can file the agenda. Um. 5.30 is hard for me. Is it? Okay. It, it, um, yeah, I mean, we all have we all have day jobs, for sure. Really? <laughs> well, you would definitely have a day job, Don. Not for night. long. No, her day job seems to extend into the night an awful lot. <laughs> um, so how about 6 o'clock? 6 o'clock is great. On the 20th, Thursday, the 21st. Right, so that's one week from tonight, six o'clock. Karen and Mark, that works for you? Yep. All right, awesome. Um, All right, so look for the um, the uh, compilation of the comments from Glenn. I'll send that out tomorrow morning and I'll file the agenda for the 21st. It will be via Zoom. Great. And then we as a sub subcommittee will we'll talk about next steps and we'll, we'll bring that back to the full commission at our next meeting. So that's it for the POCD. Thanks everybody for participating at the end at the end of June. I thought that was a great meeting. Hello. Um, can can anyone hear me? Oh yeah. Somebody wants to something like that. Yeah. Hi. Oh. Um, hi. Can you so, say um, your name, Charlotte? I'm I'm Charlotte Hurdy. You all probably know my mom, Robin Dill. She owned the bookstore for um, eight years or so. Um, I, all of you kind of look familiar. I probably know your kids, probably went to Kent Center with them. Um, you look much older. Yeah, I'm 20 now. So um, <laughs> I, this might sound ridiculous, but I was on this meeting for three hours just to say one simple thing. Um, I heard from my friends um, that I dog sit for that there was a complaint over roosters. No, you know what, Charlotte, um, yeah. we're not on that right now. Okay. And, um, um, and that, that's quick... the end of the meeting. And when we get to that, we'll get to that. Okay. Is it at the end of the meeting now or? No, no, we're, okay. uh, that's 9C and um, you can say, but I'm going to tell you, we're not going to receive any comments on it. Um, okay. We're going to receive the letter, but it's really not something for the, for the, for the planning and zoning commission, but I'll address that when we get to 9C. Thank you. Um, Thanks, though, for your engagement, Charlotte. That's, yeah. you know, it's, it's yes. Yeah, you know, I've lived here for 20 years. Um, I've always had a lot to say, but I didn't even know this thing existed. So I would have been on many more of these calls. I think I would have been the only person of my age on these calls, but I appreciate um, everything that you guys have done for, for Ken. Um, I, I, it's a great town. <laughs> it's a great town. All right, Adam, you're up. 8B, the Affordable Housing Sub Plan Subcommittee. I think that's you, David. 
It is, yes. Uh, however, I'm going to ask Alice to pinch it because on Tuesday I, um, I had a conflict and missed the meeting. Uh, I do. We did have our first draft of the meeting. Uh, our, first, our first draft of the plan was completed based on all the feedback and work to date. Uh, so this was a working meeting to, get, to go over it. Um, I had my own comments that I sent in. But Alice, maybe you can report on how the meeting itself went. Uh David, unfortunately, I was not there either, and I had noticed uh, to Jocelyn a week ago that I would not be available, so I had no idea you were not, so I, I can offer no feedback. All right, I'm waiting for the minutes from Jocelyn. Uh, she hasn't released them yet, but I will I'll, I'll either forward them or have a better update in the next meeting. Okay. We're so used to not emailing each other directly, we only email Jocelyn, and then she, we don't know what everybody else has said to each other now. <laughs> Thank you. So um, on to uh, other communications and correspondence, 9A, administrative permits and certificates of compliance. Um, does anybody have any questions? Donna, do you have any comments about it? Um, um, I, I don't know whether or not you even looked at it, but um, but I did issue a temporary certificate of zoning compliance for High Rock. I did uh, see that, but then there was a comment under it, and I didn't totally understand. Right. So basically, um, all I all I did was give them a temporary zoning compliance for the construction of the building, um, and that's basically all I did. Um, um, and I did that so that the plan, so that the building official and the fire marshal could issue a temporary CO so that they could do a ribbon cutting and have banks come in and look at it. Um, so they are going to be pushing for a full certificate of zoning compliance and a zoning permit. I did meet with Derek Transillo for about a half an hour the other day. We went over the things that he still owes us and what we need. Um, I explained the process to him, how it's going to work. Um, he's got a couple of things that he needs to take care of. They still have not obtained their state license to operate. Um, and um, they're waiting for a final sign off from the fire marshal and the building official before they do that. I talked to Alan um, uh, Gull today. Um, he came in and we went over um, He's going to go up and he's going to look at um, the parking spaces, the turning radiuses. Um, he's going to look at the, um, the special curbing or, or um, the, those um, the cement blocks. I can't remember what they're called. Pavers um, that were that were put in um, to hold the um, the fire trucks. He's going to he'll be checking all of that out and he's going to be supplying me with a final letter. So, you know, it, it could be this is the end of July, it could be as soon as the middle of August. Um, there, they, uh, Mike Doherty did call me and told me that they were having a problem with the landscaping. They wanted me to modify the landscaping and I refused to do that. I said, if you want a modification to the landscaping, you're gonna have to go to the commission because that was the only reason why you got your permit to actually do what you're doing. And I'm not going to modify that. It was a huge thing. The landscaping was a huge thing. So I told Derek that um, before I would give them a regular uh, certificate of zoning compliance and their zoning permit, I need a site plan for the landscaping um, to show that they actually installed what they had promised the commission they were going to install in order to provide the proper screening um, that was agreed upon at the special permit hearing. So, um, you know, we're still probably a month away um, at this point. So, just let you know. You know, okay. I, you know, I was waiting for someone to call and say, you yeah, can eat what? But, <laughs> um, and no, it's, it's certainly not unusual for a project of that size to, to get a, a, a temporary CO, right? A TCO first, so they can start to move in, the, move in their, uh, all the life safety stuff is done. They can start to put their, their furniture in and get, get the systems up and running and do the training. And so, yeah, that's, it seems, seems perfectly reasonable. Yep. Yeah. So that's all I have on that. Okay. So um, 
monthly financials, which we don't really have any, so we can bypass that. And um, 9C, um, you know, we can acknowledge that that a letter was sent to us. Um, it does not, this issue does not fall underneath, under the purview of the Planning and Zoning Commission. There's a right to farm ordinance, which is not under the Planning and Zoning Commission. So, um, and we don't, uh, we don't govern noise. So, um, so Adam, are we suggesting anything, or Donna, are we suggesting that this this letter go to somebody else, or are we acknowledging the letter and then and deciding not to act on it because it's not in our purview? What's what's the? He, you know, he's I mean, already. I, oh, go I, ahead, Donna. I've accepted it as just as written communication um, because they're not asking for any action. We don't we don't have any action. We don't regulate roosters are allowed in the rural district. Um, and, um, and as Adam said, we do have a right to farm ordinance, which protects any farms from nuisance um, lawsuits. If they feel that they want to change the regulations, they would need to follow the process of doing that. Um, and, uh, and I have a form here in the office that they can fill out and they can come in with a proposed change to the regulation if they want to, and then go through the public hearing process. But that's basically, um, they weren't asking for anything. Just, it's not a regulation. It's an ordinance. It's not and, a regulation. And in the in the in the in the um, meeting folder, Donna added the ordinance. It's a town ordinance, which is which is governed by the selectman's office. So this but, really isn't an issue yeah, and then, for the planning and zoning commission. And that, and that ordinance says specifically that if if you have a complaint about uh, a nuisance, take it to the first selectman. That's what they should be doing. They, so that's they, sort of where I was going. I'm sorry, it's on Dallas. I know you want to say something, Donna, too. But that's that's sort of what I was, which what where I was going, Mark, and trying to find a way to 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 maybe um, recommend to the uh, the writer of the letter where they should go from here. Right. right. They, and need they, to, they have done that, I believe. Okay. They need right. to read the right to farm ordinance. The right to farm ordinance protects the farmers from nuisance uh, nuisance loss. The regulations do state in the rural district that roosters are allowed. They are not allowed in the BR1 or the BR2 districts, but they are allowed in the rural district. So, and, and what they need to do is follow the direction um, of the right to farm ordinance. Okay, that's great. Thanks. I just I just wanted to wanted to clarify. I understand that we're we're not taking public comment, and this is just. Uh, but I, I just wanted to be to put something in words on record in the recording yep. what we thought. Okay. And hello, uh, this is Doug Nguyen. Uh, may I say one quick something, please? Oh, we thought we were, we say. We're not, uh, Doug, uh, Victor, we're not, um, we're Doug, we're not taking uh, I'm, comments I'm, on this. I'm a co-owner of the property with Victor Lewis, but yeah. I, 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 I understand. Uh, there's something that's come up and I, I do want to, uh, to mention it, please, if I may. Go ahead. Um, so Donna, thank you uh, for the discussion of the right to farm ordinance. We have read it. We, you know, and we appreciate that. This is a, kind of the first time we've heard exactly what next steps could be taken, which is great. The one thing, and I won't get into the details of the, 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 the noise factor, but um, uh, because our, all of our contact information was shared uh, on your website for the agenda today. And then uh, also, uh, uh, Ms. Fiedler, Mr. Uh, Libero, and Ms. Karen Eckel, um, all neighbors of ours, uh, have had a Facebook social media frenzy, and we have been vilified. So given that our contact information has been shared on your website, we're getting very disturbing calls uh, and uh, full of vitriol. Uh, we've had garbage thrown on our property in just 24 hours. And so please, uh, we, we just ask uh, for mutual respect. Uh, we, we, we're good people and we, we just, we're not attacking anyone. We're just not sure what to do about the excessive noise, but we seriously didn't want garbage and, and, uh, uh, very disturbing phone calls to be made to us. So we're, we're a little frightened at this point. I'm sorry that's happening. I, I there's, we have no, um, control. We, uh, you know, Anybody who sends sends correspondence into us, I mean, it's the law. We have to 
all, right. that, that all that information has to be posted. We yeah. don't have the ability to not. Okay. I just wanted all of you to be, all of you to be aware that there has been a a lot of negative things happening to us in the past 24 hours because of all of this and this discussion and social media. So, um, but anyway, thank you. That's all I have to say on this right now. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, I, 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 that's it's shameful. So I, 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 I echo Adam's dismay at that behavior and I'll, I'll yeah, absolutely shameful. Okay, and, I, and, and I'm sorry for interrupting, but sincerely, thank you for, for, for this small moment. Um, Donna, are we gonna go into executive session? Yes, I have a lot of things to report. Okay, so um, can I get a motion to move to executive session, please? I'll move that we enter executive session regarding the open uh, legal action against us. Uh, 10, 11, and 12, right, David? Yep, all three at once. I'll second the motion, Donna. Thanks, Karen. All in favor? So you're going to go into. Um, I'm going move. to put um, everybody into the waiting room. Um, and I'm just going to say that we're going to move into executive session at executive session at nine fifty seven. Okay, everybody's in the waiting room. I'm going to pause. Okay, so we're back out of executive session at 1023. So um, can somebody make a motion for all three um, topics that we plan that we um, will follow our attorney's recommendations? Yeah, it's not three because we don't have three lawsuits. Oh, it's just two. It's just for the two. Okay. So I, I would move that uh, I, I would move that uh, that we make the same recommendations we make every time we come out of executive session um, that we follow the the, uh, um, the recommendations, recommendations of our attorney. Okay. Yeah, Mr. Winter moved to follow the recommendations of the attorney and have done in his report back to the commission on that as the matter progresses. I will second. I'll memorize that for next time, Donna. <laughs> All in favor? Copy and paste. Motion carries. And um, a motion to adjourn. To We're adjourned at 1025. Wow. All right. Whoa. Not bad, Adam. Not bad That's at all. too long. <laughs> this was a late I thought night. this was going to be a short meeting tonight. I thought so, too. So did Wes. He was. We all thought it was.